Okay, great, it works. Yeah, so welcome everybody, um, and thanks to the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, my name is Gustav Weniger, uh, um, and yeah, I'm working in Amsterdam. I'm a theoretical physicist by training and a cosmologist, usually by, by heart and by work and astroparticle physicist. But what I'm really obsessed uh, with is tackling difficult data analysis problems. And so four years ago, I started actually looking into modern machine learning techniques before um, yeah, I, I was mostly following what was common in the field, but deep learning, of course, became uh, quite prominent. And so I started looking into how deep learning can be useful for the analysis problems that we face uh, in my research field. And so what I want to talk about in these two lectures is um, yeah, simulation-based inference for large forward models in physics and astronomy. And um, the, the terms will become clear throughout the, the lecture. If you have any questions, please just feel free to ask, raise your hand, interrupt me. Um, we will also have a Q&A session at the end of the first and the second lecture, but really, since I'm a theoretical physicist and not a machine learning person, really, I, I found it a bit challenging to gauge the level of the talk to the audience because it's the first time I talk in a um, machine learning PhD school. So if it's too fast, if it's too slow, if you are bored or like overwhelmed, just like let me know and then I can adapt the pace. Good. So the first lecture will be about large forward models, what that actually means. I made up that term, by the way, so I have to define it. Large forward models and physics uh, for in physics and astronomy and traditional inference approaches. And I assume you have seen uh, much of that already in lectures, like during your time at university, but I, I try to give you an overview of uh, what are actually the problems that we face. And in lecture two, I will start talking about deep learning approaches to solve these problems um, and inference assembly, which is also something that we uh, made up and I try to explain it. So lecture one, large forward models in physics and astronomy. And um, before I can get started with the actual techniques and models, I first want to give you an overview of how actually the playing ground in which all this research happens that, that I'm, I'm interested in actually uh, looks like. And this playground is essentially the universe uh, from the Big Bang to today uh, at various scales. So I, I will give you a very brief overview of how the universe looks like and worked according to our un un uh, current understanding. So ac according to our best models, the universe and time and space and everything started 13.5 billion years ago with the Big Bang. And there was a short inflationary period that expanded space exponentially. And then the universe started cooling down after one to three minutes. The first nuclear, atomic nuclei formed because the universe was cool enough so that they could remain stable. Then not much happens until 300,000 years after the Big Bang. This is when the first atoms formed and the universe became transparent. And then again, uh, it was mostly dark until about uh, 300 million years after the Big Bang when uh, the first stars formed. And initially the universe was just a homogeneous soup of, of material with tiny, tiny fluctuations which were caused by probably by quantum uncertainties in the, um, in, uh, in the uh, early on. And those initial density fluctuations started to collapse under their own gravity and started to form structures as we see this today. And so the initial parts can be very well described by, by analytical equations and simple, um, uh, re relatively simple uh, equations that, that we can solve with Boltzmann solvers for instance. However, if we go to late times, the universe becomes quite complicated, right? We get nonlinear structure, we get eventually us. And so we need numerical simulations. And you see here a numerical simulation that starts around 0.4 billion years after the Big Bang. And what you see here is uh, what we call dark matter. So it's something that we don't know much about, except that it's heavy and that it seems to be there, which collapses under its own gravity into these structures, which will finally host galaxies. And I, I play the movie through. Uh, it takes a bit of a time, but um, so you see here roughly a region of the universe that will, in the end, contain something like our own galaxy and nearby galaxies. So it's a relatively small zoomed-in region. The simulation here itself is a hydrodynamical simulation that uh, requires that has, I think, 10 or 20 billion mesh points, so it requires quite significant computing resources. 
So what you saw before is dark matter, and now you see actually the gas, so material that we are made of, that uh, f felt into the dark matter halos, and you see there are stars exploding that formed, which enriched the material around uh, those dark matter halos again with uh, processed uh, with processed nuclei. So there, there are more heavy nuclei. Initially, we just have essentially uh, um, hydrogen and helium. This is now also containing carbon and other elements. And so the evolution goes on and goes on. Maybe I should skip a bit forward. No, okay. I, yeah. So what, what this does is that this provides feedback to how galaxies actually form. So it affects how m massive galaxies will be, where they will be distributed. Now you see actually in different colors here which material has a lot of heavy nuclei and which has less heavy nuclei, which also affects again how stars form. And eventually we need these heavier nuclei to form planets, right, and form us. And then at the very end this will turn again into this blue color, which are the dark matter halos that are around these little galaxies that you see everywhere. And um, this is one of these simulations. So you, you can't run millions of these simulations. Typically, you can afford running a few, um, because this year uh, took up to 20 million CPU hours. So it's quite hefty. And what we event eventually do is actually we use this simulation, for instance, to measure the statistical distribution of galaxies. How many heavy ones do we have? How many light ones do we have? How the, are they clustered? And we compare it with actual observations that might look like this. So here, the here we would be at the center, Earth, and this here is the result of a galaxy survey that t tells you how galaxies are clustered in different directions of the sky. So you see they, they cluster in specific way in these filamentary structures. And by combine comparing statistically how the distribution of galaxies that you observe looks like with the predictions of the models, we can say something about the dynamic equations that govern the universe, the initial conditions, the content, and so on and so forth. Um, good. And, and nowadays, in like astronomy and cosmology, we can base these kind of studies on a huge range of observations over the entire magnetic electromagnetic spectrum from radio frequencies over microwave, infrared, and visible light, of course, ultraviolet, X-ray, and gamma rays. Um, and so for gamma rays, for instance, yeah, I, I will come to, to gamma ray examples a bit later on. Um, and all this re emission here is produced typically by vastly different mechanisms. So the emission that we see in these different frequencies can be of quite different origin and all tells a separate story about the universe. Since 2014, also we observe uh, gravitational waves, which I will get to, so that open a new window to observing the universe. And there are many open questions, um, for instance, related to what generated the initial conditions, what are the dynamical equations that describe the universe, so essentially is, are Einstein equations right, or should we modify them? Then questions like, how do actually galaxies form in detail, how do stars explode, and then is there dark matter, or do we need to change the equations that we run, and what it is made of, and so on and so forth. Good. So, um, this was the universe, like, in a nutshell. Um, I, I will not go back to, like, the entire picture during the lecture, but I will use a few examples that are relevant in this context and in this, in this research field uh, as examples throughout the lectures, and I, I will tell you a bit more details. Yeah. So overall, the models that we have work extremely well to the extent, um, and it depends on what time you are looking at. But um, I mean, it looks, it's quite ridiculous to think that one can explain the universe like from 10 to the minus 30 seconds to today. Um, so, but, but it works surprisingly well. So for instance, one period probably that one can be most sure of is this one minute to three minutes after the Big Bang which one can describe by knowing just nuclear physics from Earth and applying it to the early universe. And this gives you predictions for how much uh, helium is there, how much lithium is there, how much uh, hydrogen should be there, and you can compare it with observations. This, this is difficult because afterwards stars process the material and change it. But this works surprisingly well. Also, like the, our inflationary models that predict how the initial structure looked like in the universe works surprisingly well. That said, there are a lot of open questions still, and also discrepancies and heated debates. But, um, yeah. But ask me more about this um, during the coffee break. Maybe there's a lot behind this. Good. Um,
the overview lecture one. So I will first talk about large forward models and uh, what you just saw, this forward simulation would be one example of that. Then I will talk about inverse problems, uh, which is the problem of, okay, we have a simulation for something that we observe. How do we now work back from an observation to say something about the simulation parameters in a consistent, statistically meaningful way, especially in situations where the models are very large and difficult to run. And then I will talk about traditional approaches to solving these inverse problems, which are, um, which is basically like a overview of, of statistics uh, from the 20th century uh, in some sense and the challenges that this poses. Um, good, so large forward models. Um, to introduce what I mean with this, it's useful to look at a, a set of specific observations uh, of, of the sky and um, at, at gamma ray frequencies. So I mentioned gamma rays before in this like electromagnetic spectrum, they sit at the high energy end. So all these, wh what you see here is basically uh, the full sky observation of gamma rays. You see here the, the Milky Way band essentially, and here in the center is the galactic center. And what you see is that, wh that what I highlight here uh, is that over time, the, the observations, of course, became better, right? So in the 70s, actually, it looked like this. Nowadays, it looks like this. And the result is that in the 70s, we just had to model six point sources. So you see, like, six isolated little sources, which are pulsars, um, doesn't matter here, but so isolated sources that you have to model, and there may be some disk emission. Already in the 90s, we suddenly had 200 sources to model and extended point sources, gas, and so on. Nowadays, we have many thousand sources, highly resolved gas, many different components that actually determine how the sky looks like. And that's a general trend that you see in all kinds of astrophysical observations or cosmological, cosmological observations. If you have more data, you simply see more objects. Um, you see more and more of the universe, right? And if you have more objects, you need more parameters to parameterize their properties, where they are, how, what type of object they are. And if you use traditional data analysis, te analysis techniques, as I will discuss, more parameters typically lead to suffering for whoever has to analyze the data, for the person who has to compare models with data. And nowadays, given that the data becomes better and better, we are often forced to do more and more compromises in doing these kind of analysis right, which, which is not great. Um, good, so why, why is this data interesting in the first place? Um, so one can, for instance, look at the galactic center, and one topic that I worked a lot at, a uh, lo lot on over the le uh, years, uh, sorry, um, is to look at the galactic center here, and there was a heated debate, and there's still a debate, whether the emission that comes, for instance, from the galactic center here uh, is either some very exotic was but Nobel Prize winning dark matter self-annihilation, so then we would have uh, suddenly discovered what dark matter is and could measure its mass and so on, or whether it's these objects here. These are uh, millisecond pulsars. So imagine like something with the mass of the sun squashed into something as the size of Krakow and rotating 500 times a second. So these objects are probably very abundant in the galactic center and one can so in this inner region, and one can model their emission, they should produce a lot of gamma rays. And so distinguishing this scenario from this scenario by looking at the disk emission here, subtracting everything that is along the line of sight is extraordinarily difficult. And there are a bunch of research groups working on this, coming to different conclusions. It's difficult to, to pin this fully down. Um, so this is one example for uh, a large forward model. If, uh, and I come back to that. So if one wants to describe data sets like this here, you need just a very large model because it needs to uh, contain a lot of degrees of freedom. Another topic that I uh, want to introduce is strong lensing images. Um, this is something I started working on four years ago in context of also learning deep learning because somebody told me that's like really hard problem and then I used it as a uh, basically playground to explore what deep learning techniques can help. Um, we are still working on it, it's really a hard problem. Um, good, so the basic idea is here, let's say we, you have two galaxies along the line of sight. You have a blue one, and behind the blue one is a red one. G uh, gravity actually bends light, right? And what, what this uh, does, um, what this leads to, 
there are observations that look like this. So you have the foreground galaxy is uh, still just this undistorted foreground galaxy, but the background galaxy is stretched into a ring like structure or multiple images. And this is a lens image. And the details of this lens here will tell you some, the details of the lens image tell you something about what's the mass in this lens galaxy, where are, and how is mass distributed? Are there little clumps of mass, for instance? Or analyzing these images is very difficult because you have to analyze how the source galaxy looks like. It never looks like a little dot. It looks like actually a galaxy. Uh, lens and then the foreground galaxy and the mass distribution. So basically you have to do image reconstruction. So taking one image and reconstruct three or four images from the, from the single image. Just to visualize this a bit better, I made this little movie here. So um, what you see here is a, oh, I go back. What you see here is a, a mock, so basically a simple model. So the foreground galaxy and then this ring-like thing around it, which is the background galaxy. And if I pretend I can remove the foreground galaxy, which in reality I can't easily, then you see if I change some of the parameters of the, f of the lens, the image actually changes quite a bit. You see it. Um, this is just changing the lens. You can, I mean, this is like you, you take a wine glass and put it in front of a of a light, right? You get similar effects. It's, it's exactly looking like this. If, if we could move galaxies <laughs> around, it would look like this in the sky. Um, good, but we can't, right? So we <laughs> actually need to take an image like this and fit it. And um, okay, now what you probably don't see are these little red dots here, which are subhalos, so cl little clumps in the lens. And if you see, if you don't see this, so um, let me go here to the video. So, and we don't know where these clumps are, but if you move them randomly around, you see this image flicker, right? I guess you see it a bit flicker. So it's this kind of flickering that we are actually interested in. So for each specific image, we only would see one fixed image, right? So it doesn't flicker. But this, the subhalos affect the overall image in a very specific way, and we can try to actually measure from how the, how the image is distorted the number of subhalos that we have. At least we can try. And um, why this is relevant is because you, you see actually dark matter distributions for different models. So some models lead to more little clumps, subhalos, and some models lead to le less little clumps. And so if you could do this kind of analysis, we could learn something about the mass of dark matter. This again is a very difficult problem because there are lots of parameters to deal with and we want to just measure something that is very minutely affecting the data in the end. Um, another example, gravitational waves. So, and that's the last example, and then we go more to the statistics side and machine learning side. So, um, what you see here are two black holes that spiral around. It's a binary black hole system. The color. So, what you see now in red here is how how this um, how this rotation actually radiates of gravitational waves. So, these are distortions in space-time that carry away energy, and while energy is carried away, the, the system starts to lose angular momentum and spirals in, and at the end we, we get a merger. And so the signal that we can observe at Earth, or the way we observe this at Earth, is we take like very, very precise length detect measurements, uh, so laser beams uh, of the length of maybe a kilometer, and then these gravitational waves, when they hit Earth, they affect the length of the system by like a tiny fraction of, the, of an atomic nucleus. So uh, the size of an atomic nucleus is 10 to minus 15, this is 10 to minus 18. So it's a pretty tough measurement, but nowadays, one can, since 2014, it works. And one observes signals that look like this. So the last phase of like a, two, a binary black hole system that spins up and becomes fast, and then bo both black holes merge, and then there's a ring down. And Right, so one can visualize, for instance, the way space-time is affected in this funny way here. So space-time is stretched and compressed in different directions. And the speed with, and here you see this signal basically as function of time, 3D plotted by somebody. Um, and you see that depending on what is the mass of the initial black holes, uh, the si system, uh, the, the frequencies uh, uh, lower, or it can be faster, it can be very fast if the system emerges. And based on, on these observations, we then have to work back what are the parameters, where does this happen. Good, so what are um, large forward models? Um, right, well, I, what, what I mean with forward model, or what forward model generally refers to, are simulation models. So we plug in some parameter z, 
which might be a lot of parameters or a few, so something like what's the content of the universe, the initial density fluctuations of the universe, pulsars in gamma ray sky or whatnot. And then we run the simulator and the simulator predicts us how a specific observation can look like gamma rays uh, black, um, or, or time variation in gravitational wave detector. And uh, what makes this forward model large is either complexity, it's because we have a lot of parameters, or the amount of data we have to analyze. Sometimes we have just the gamma ray sky, but maybe we have also to include other observations. Um, and then computational resources. Sometimes running this simulation once even takes days or weeks or months, um, and then you can't afford running many. And what's, what's specific actually in the context of maybe physics and astronomy um, is that these models typically are, are uh, principled. So we try to start with laws of physics and then write up our forward models. And so all the parameters Z that enter these models typically have a very specific uh, meaning, physical meaning. Good. So before I go to inverse problems, are there any questions about this? So I, I realized, especially if you have not a background in this, that might be a lot of information at once. Sorry, just um, just one thing. Um, so we have people viewing the stream. So um, if you ask questions, it's better to do it with uh, with the mic. I, I can also repeat and otherwise the questions. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question regarding like these lens galaxies. Yeah. Um, so is it a like problem that you you don't have like the access to the parameters of the lens, like distance to the galaxy yeah. and distance to the target galaxy, and you have to derive that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, there are different measurements that could tell you something about the distance to the objects, but basically, in the end, you, you, have, you have one image, and you have to reconstruct all these other images from it, how the original source looked like, how the mass distribution in the lens looks like, and so on. So it turns out to be quite difficult, degenerate problem. Yeah. More questions? So what do you say? It means that uh, you can have different results from the same same data with different parameter. Yes. Yeah. So what is the constraint of that that you see if it's co close to what you think it's correct or not? Um, I, I I guess that will be the the topic of the rest of the lecture in some sense. Oh so okay. I, I <laughs> no no I mean it's a it's a very good question. I, I will uh, go through this in, in step by step uh, or try to to go through this and yeah ask ask more questions. Yeah. Um, maybe I go on f for now. Um, good. So inverse problems. So what, what you brought up was just inverse problems. <laughs> so so the, the, uh, the, the difficult thing is now, or the examples that I brought were, um, are related to the problem of we have a model that, that we use to simulate data, and then we have an actual observation. How do we now work backwards from that model? Right, and for instance, say okay, the mass of the first black hole that merged was this, and the mass of the other thing was that. Or how do we say something about the prob the average number or the expected? Yeah, how do we get the probability distribution for the number of subhalos in an image like this? These are tricky questions, and they are related in general to the inverse. Ah, sorry for jumping back and forth to the inverse problem. And so, how how do inverse? So, who have you heard about the words inverse problems? Actually, right. Just raise your hand. Okay, thanks. So it's about half. So what is the inverse problem? Well, before I called the simulations forward model, right? So now basically we try, and, and in physics, we, we typically know how to forward model something because that's kind of what physics is about. Um, but then we have to solve the inverse problem, which is where why physicists need statistics. So we have to work backwards from the observation that was motivated by a model uh, which gives us data through a process called statistical inference to tell us something again about the model. And we can do this uh, with data that we gathered on Earth, where we have the advantage that we can actually do experimental design, right, and enhance the effects that we want to measure and suppress the ones that we don't want to measure. Um, but in the sky, we, we don't have that luxury, right? We can't take one of the galaxies just and wiggle around and see what happens. So we, it, we just got one sky. And so often the effects that we want to measure are actually quite small and we can't enhance them. We just have to do a careful analysis. Um, good. So how this connects to large forward models will be kind of the top topic of the rest of the lecture. But uh, what I want to start with is actually a small forward model, which is the Galton board. Um, and talk through this in some detail because then I can connect what we learned there with a much more complicated setups. 
Who has uh, seen this before? Yeah, I guess that's like a standard example in some machine learning literatures. I also like it a lot. So uh, then this will be for you a recap. So what's the Galton board? You see here it's basically a central limit theori theorem uh, generator. So you have a bunch of balls that drop here and uh, hit these little pins and bounce around. And then at some point they decide, uh, yeah, so they take a specific path and end up in a bin down here. And uh, thanks to the central limit theorem, this starts looking like a, like a Gaussian in the end. Okay, so you see that actually the movement of the individual balls is they, they bounce around, right? That's, uh, if you want to actually model this properly, you probably run a numerical simulation. Um, but what we will do is to, to not run a numerical simulation, but just come up with a simple uh, mathematical model that gives similar answers or give, gives a very, a th that's also a nice playground for us for, for understanding some aspects of this. So imagine we have this Galton board here with seven different layers, okay? And we drop a ball at the top. Then there is a, then we assume the, the system might be a bit biased, so there is a probability lambda that it goes to the right and the probability minus lambda that it goes to the left, okay? And let's call uh, where it goes, so, so x equals zero corresponds it goes to the left, x equal one corresponds it goes to the right, yeah? And then we can write down uh, the probability, um, simply here as a simple, uh, so, so the probability here follows a Bernoulli distribution, so we can write it like this. Probability of going to the left would be one minus lambda, the probability to go to the right would be just lambda. Okay, this is for one pin. Now, um, we can also calculate the probability of a specific path, right? So the ball can now make a lot of these decisions. Like here, specifically, it took the decision left, right, right, left, right, 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 and ended up in bin five. And the probability for a specific path would be here just the product of the individual choices, uh, the probabilities of the individual choices. So we have here still this very similar structure. We have lambda to the power of y, which is now the number of uh, steps to the right, and then one minus lambda, which is the number of, uh, to the power of the steps uh, in direction, uh, in, in left direction. So far, so good. So we have now actually a probability distribution for the overall path, right? But now the tricky aspect is that, or in some sense the tricky aspect is that there are multiple ways to reach the final bin five. Right, so let's consider the case that we actually don't observe individual paths, but just the final distribution of points. So the probability distribution of the path itself isn't very helpful. It's something that is tractable. It's something we can easily calculate. Um, it's something we can easily understand, but it's nothing we actually observe. So what we act in the end have to do is we have to um, uh, look at the probability and derive the probability distribution for these balls falling into a specific bin which I call here y, so in here in this case it's bin 5. And we do this by simply summing over the probabilities of all paths that lead eventually to, to that bin, right? So you see here a sum over all paths x, x is a vector which has these seven components, and we only take those paths that eventually sum up to y, so, so that leads to a bin y, okay? And if one does this, then suddenly you get this combinatorial factor here, which happens to just be the bin, uh, be, uh, binomial coefficient. So we get a uh, binomial distribution in the end. So I, I kind of lied, so you don't get a Gaussian fully, but in this case you get a binomial distribution, which happens to, looks pretty ha happens to look pretty Gaussian if you take a lot of layers. Okay, so that, that's now our statistical model. And um, it has only one parameter, right, lambda, which tells the bias. You could have different biases for each bin, or, uh, right, or each pin, then you would end up with this very complicated model. Um, but this here is a, a simple model where the, the probability distribution of the observation, the, the likelihood function is still tractable. We can write it down. We have a, we have a simple mathematical model. Um, are there questions about that? Who has seen this before? Okay, so I'm not boring everybody. Uh, so good. So I want to highlight, like, okay, you, you have a path, right? M multiple paths that lead to the same observations, and you, you need to deal with that. Okay, so now we get to inverse problems. So the inverse problems now typically involve working backwards from the actual effects, from the observation that we do, to the cause. So to, the, to let, in this case, the, the 
board simulation, lambda. And in the, our case, this was given a list of ball positions. We are interested in, in saying what's the bias, actually. Um, and um, right, so, so that's the inverse problem in some sense. So we want to go back from observations to, to parameters. And we can do this uh, with a long list of observations. And I will do this on the next slide. So typically, this entails uh, using observed data to infer parameters or conditions uh, that produce it. And the process often requires a simple either mathematical model, which we just wrote down, or computer simulations. Good. So what I will discuss here is uh, Bayesian inference, and I will entirely focus on that. There's also frequentist inference. So who knows, uh, who, who has worked or heard about frequentist inference and used this for anything? Okay. So a few of you. So in, in our field, the, there, is, there are very strong opinions about either using frequentism or Bayesian interpretations of data. Particle physicists would all the time use frequentist approaches, whereas cosmologists and also um, astrophysicists often use Bayesian approaches. We focus here on Bayesian approaches mostly because ma much of the machine learning tools that wi I will discuss later on actually happen to work in this Bayesian framework. But I'm happy to uh, discuss this. So, Bayes theorem. So, we now use Bayes theorem to actually say something about the underlying parameters. Let's so, Bayes theorem, you have all seen this, right? So, we have here a likelihood function for data x given parameters z. Then we need a prior probability distribution for the parameter z. And then if I multiply both and divide by some normalizing factor, I end, with what's uh, end up with what's called the posterior probability for parameter z given data x, right? So that's, um, that's simply Bayes' theorem. And in the Galtenbord example, x corresponds to the final ball position y, and z corresponds to, to lambda, the, the only parameter that we dealt with so far. Um, Okay, so now let's assume we actually didn't just observe uh, one final ball position, but multiple. Okay, so let's let's say we run the experiment and some or we throw like n balls to the Galton board. Then we end up actually with with a vector of observations, right? So with uh, n uh, values for y. And if we assume that all these measurements happen independently, completely independently, we can just write the probability distribution of um, of this vector of y as a product of uh, the individual likelihoods, right? So we just have here the product over p of yi given lambda. And this just turns into a product over these um, binomial distributions. And what's now nice, again, is because everything is reasonably simple, that if we start with a, with a flat prior on lambda, so we, we assume uniform prior for lambda. We actually get an analytical solution for the Galton board. So for the, this year should be a lambda, sorry. Uh, we get an analytical solution for the posterior value of lambda given all the observations, which will be just given by the better distribution. And, and that's it. So this is an example of a problem which can be actually analytically solved because we started with a reasonable but somewhat simplistic uh, mathematical model for the problem, right? And then we can, for instance, uh, look at the posterior distribution. You see it here. Uh, after one measurement, it would be still quite broad. So I, it doesn't visualize here where the ball fell, but this is based actually on, on 12, um, 12 layers. But if you then run this thing uh, and, and incre increase the number of balls that one uh, drops to the Galton board, the measurement becomes better and better. And you see that actually the Galton board that is used here doesn't have a zero bias, which would correspond to lambda equals 0 0.5, but it has a bias that's 0 0.6. Um, good. Questions about that? This plot here was generated by ChatGPT, by the way. So you just describe like Galtenbord, visualize it in an animated GIF, and spits out a Python code. It's quite fun. So, um, questions about that? Good. So in real, so um, I will come to more complicated examples in a second. So for now, we can write down this uh, Galtenbord in this simple graphical model, right? Uh, 
So we have this bias parameter, which is a random variable in this framework here, somewhere between 0 and 1. And this bias parameter determines then a path, which if you have 12 layers will be a vector with 12 numbers, x. And this path then deterministically in this case here determines where the ball ends up, which we called y. And if you have n of these measurements, we can use this plate notation to indicate uh, that we actually ran this last part here, the second part of the model um, n times, right? And this lower ball here, this lower circle is filled in gray, I think, this, it's hard to see. Anyway, so it's grayed out, and, and that means, uh, and this indicates here in the setup simply that that's one of the variables that we observed. Okay, and what this model, this gr graphical model here knows, uh, shows nicely together is that we perform, as I said, n draws of the random variable y n, uh, y i, um, by throwing n balls through the Galton board, and then there's a common parameter which yeah, determines x on an observation. Yeah, I said all of that. Good, so that's a simple model. In reality, the problem is that models can look much more complicated. So I'm going now back to, to the Fermi sky, so to the gamma ray sky that I showed before. Um, if you think about all the physical mechanisms that actually lead to what you observe here, the underlying model, graphical model, that would describe the data becomes very complicated. Actually, nobody ever wrote down that model because it's n usually not the way uh, people in my field approach this problem. And it, it's just a very difficult um, hierarchical model, um, um, graphical model. You can also think about it as a probabilistic model in some sense. So I, I just highlight here a few aspects of the model. It's a very simplified sketch. So for instance, you would need, you have some parameters that describe, for instance, how sources, gamma ray sources, are distributed over the sky. So it's like a bit like the bias parameter. So it determines like the overall distribution. Are they going to high latitudes or in the disk and so on. Then you have the parameters for each individual source that describe where it is, how far it is away, what's the spectrum, what's the type. Um, and then there might be actually observations from other frequencies that this also like implies, which you want to take into account in the model. Then you have other parameters that describe where actually this disk emission comes from. Where do the high energetic particles come from that generate the disk emission? What's the magnetic field? How is starlight distributed? How is gas distributed? How are different types of gas distributed? Um, how do different physical mechanisms work? And this all leads then to like your final observation here at the very bottom. And this is the thing that you actually have, right? So the observation in this case here would be gamma ray sky plus additional information. And the, so this would be x. And the parameter z would be all kinds of parameters that you can think about. And as I mentioned earlier on, the problem is that the more you observe, the more you have to include here, right? So eventually, you have to include the entire universe if you, if you keep going, because you s keep observing more and more of it. So at least everything that con contributes to, to the gamma ray emission in the Milky Way, but also a way, so ex there are extra galactic components that come from even early times of the universe. So th these are complicated models. And we, have we, we are kind of increasingly failing to deal with them in the context of traditional inference techniques. Another in interesting aspect of this is that we have to, that in principle, the same data, that data set poses different inference challenges. So one would be, there's an object detection problem, right? So we need to detect where do we have these, these little sources. It, th this would be like, okay, you try and in the end, if you do this with deep learning, a unit, you tell, you see where are the sources. Then this is a classification problem. So for each of the object, you want to classify it, what, what type of source it is. Then it's a population level analysis where you have lists of sources and you want to analyze how they are distributed. It's a spectral analysis where you analyze energy spectra or time series data. You have to do overlapping image reconstruction tasks for things that you can't describe otherwise. Then there are Bayesian model selection problems that you have to deal with, and so on and so forth. So what's all of these uh, things here, all the of these challenges have, for all of these tasks, there are methods that are specialized to do them and do them well and that are very well motivated. What really turns out to be very difficult is that, that we have to deal with all of these complications simultaneously. So it's not a pure image analysis task, not a pure object detection task, and so on and so forth. And that's, that's what's making it very, very hard and increasingly more difficult. Um, where is this? Okay, good. So now I want to give you kind of an overview over traditional um, analysis approaches. 
I'm pretty good in time, so maybe we'll have time for questions. Um, traditional analysis approaches. Um, but before I go there, are there any questions? Yeah. So I was just looking through this example of the Gauten board and had the question, what is the importance of inductive biases in the field? Because when I look at the Gauten board, it has the Gaussian distribution after all, right? So if I start very naively, I probably say it's not binomial distribution, but it's some Gaussian. You know, I have input, I have output. Um, and my assumption that it probably might lead to a different outcome in your analysis, right? So, and in this field of um, astronomy, what, where do you start from? How many inductive biases you use? And could different inductive biases lead to different results in your analysis? That's a very good question and a very broad question. So regarding the, the um, Galton board, in the end, the fact that we got a Bernoulli, uh, the better, sorry, better distribution as a result, this is just a consequence of the model assumptions. So um, I guess if, if the result wouldn't have, I mean, the, the model itself is quite simplistic, right? So if the result wouldn't have fit the observations, probably one would have come up with another simpli a simple model that worked better. Um, in astronomy or in, in physics, often, yeah, it's a bit, I mean, there are an, a, a wide range of sources for inductive biases. So often, and it will be a bit easier to discuss this later on. Often, because these problems are so hard, one is forced to simplify the models and, simply and use also approximations when analyzing problems. And this introduces various inductive biases. And often, you end up with results that just don't agree with each other. And it's then the, the most simple way of interpreting this is that this is kind of your systematic uncertainty. Uh, so to which degree you can find answers to problems. So it's assumption dependent. In other cases, when uh, the situation is good and results are not that much dependent on, uh, on, on, on the methodology, like in early universe cosmology, results are pretty stable. Um, but there are also inductive biases that would come from, um, and I should say that particle physicists or cosmologists and so on don't use that term. But uh, I, I, Okay, so there are inductive biases that come from model assumptions, which models do, does one prefer over others and so on. But often these models are not directly strictly compared in a like, strictly Bayesian sense. So they, there's one group working on one model, another group on another model, and then one, one tries to maybe pr uh, propose additional observations to, to settle on what, what's correct or whatnot. But yeah, it's a very um, context-dependent problem. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, there was one more. Hi. Um, I was wondering how is that data represented? Do we represent as an RGB image? If so, what is its resolution? Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I didn't put it here. So this here would be represented, uh, you, you see here just basically um, the number of photons, number of gamma rays observed above a certain energy. I forgot which one, probably 1 GeV, doesn't matter. So it's, it's number of photons that you see here. But what the experiment actually measures is individual photons, their arrival direction, their energy, and when it was measured. So you, you could make a list of of, of events, which, which and each event would be described by four numbers. Or you could put it in these sky maps, for instance. But think of this here more as a visualization of a histogram. And you can also produce now different sky maps for different energies. So you can make one that's just showing photons between 1 and 2 GV, 2 and 4 GV, 4 and 8, and so on. And so you end up basically, let's say, with 20 of these maps. And on top of that, there's in principle time information. So you could end up with one of these, like, um, cubes, data cubes, uh, each second or each minute or each day. Um, there was one aspect more to this. What did, I, did I answer? Ah, right, the number of pixels. So typically, uh, one would resolve here this guy in, let's say, 100,000 pixels or more. So that's the way uh, the data would, re would be represented if you, if you um, bin it. And what is the difference between the data that's received every day? Because I, in my imagination, initially, it was that this whole thing is static. Like you get yep. you get one picture and that's how it is and it's gonna stay like that. So what different information do we get every day? If ah okay, so there are actually some sources that are time varying on very short time scales. So for instance, pulsars, they are time varying on like seconds. And um and then there are other sources who vary on days or, or, or years, time scales. So depending on this time variability, actually one can dis 
distinguish different sources. But usually the way one would analyze data is one treats everything as static and tries to make like progress there and then picks out individual sources which might be time varying and analyze them separately. So one would ran yeah, seldomly represent the data as a gigantic histogram um, in, in, in four dimensions. Thanks. Yeah. There's one question there. So in the Bayesian, uh, uh, the Bayes uh, theorem slide, you uh, did not label the P of X term. And uh, so does that play a role in your models? Because sampling from an unnormalized distribution is extremely difficult. So to get the P of X, you need to perform like a Monte Carlo integral yes, or yes, something. Yes. Yeah. So with what regime are you working in? Like, do you want an unnormalized distribution or do you want to normalize the distribution and is it tough? Yeah, th that, that's, that's a good point. I, I will come to these techniques. Um, th this is just Bayes' theorem itself. And um, so the techniques one uses in the end depend also very much on the situation. So yeah, here P of, yes, I completely agree. Calculating P of X can be horribly complicated. Oh. <laughs> there, there was one more question. You mentioned that so some data sources are actually time varying in, in, in short time spans. Um, I was wondering whether you actually work with the assumption of stationarity of, of the like the dynamical system. Like there is some um, distribution of states that is not really changing through time. Yeah, I mean this is very. I'm kind of using all kinds of examples <laughs> throughout the lecture, but for this particular example here, gamma, so gamma ray sky observations, you would assume that most of it is just completely static on for the purpose of the experiment. There are individuals, that the, the point is this, this is a huge chunk of the sky, right? So there, there, there are no dynamical mechanisms that could change large scale features uh, on like short time scales because of causality, it's too large. But if you have like so, uh, short or uh, small point sources, then they can change very rapidly. And so on individual source by source basis, sometimes one has to take into account time information. Okay, I, I can take more questions later on. Maybe some of the questions also clarify uh, during the next part, which is traditional approaches to solving the inverse problem. And good, so brief, histori <laughs> brief historical overview. So in the pre 20th century, you are all like 21st century, right? I, I still want to. 20th century. Anyway, so pre 20th century, uh, were there were mostly analytical methods that people could use. You didn't have computers, right? Uh, <laughs> then the early 20th century came up, uh, so there were Im I important um, developments in terms of hypothesis testing, maximum likelihood to likelihood ratio techniques, profile likelihood, which are until today used heavily in our field for especially frequency statistics. Then there were numerical approaches, Markov chain Monte Carlos, which I will come to, that, that help you to solve inverse problems using Bayes' theorem, for instance. And then we have seen in recent years or decades the rise of machine learning, things like decision trees, uh, support vector machines, regularization techniques. And now, of course, we have an explosion of anything related to deep learning. Uh, and there are good reasons for it. And um, I, I will now cover like what are the challenges with non-deep learning techniques, first of all, to set the stage for explaining how to solve and tackle some of these problems with, the, uh, with deep learning. Good, so sampling, or okay, before I can get there, I have to talk a bit about sampling uh, versus uh, likelihood evaluation versus uh, score. So wh what can we actually do with a likelihood model, right? So before I just had the example with the Galton board, um, where we had P of X given Z, X was the bin and Z, the, uh, the parameter lambda. But I also said, okay, this actually could be like a simulator of gamma ray sky, right? Where Z is everything you know about the universe that produces gamma rays, and X is what you ex the list of photons essentially that you observe with the experiments. Um, good, and, and these are very different processes, and the, the point is that one can do different things with the likelihood function. And I, I think this is very obvious to most of you but it's important to be explicit about it. So first, if you have a likelihood model, right? So something like this, a conditional probability distribution, we might be able to sample from it, right? I'm not saying how necessarily, but there's a process, uh, so we, we can draw samples from it. And for this, we typically need, in, in the end, a stochastic program, let's call it sim as function of Z, 
which takes as input z, our model parameters, and then spits out a random sample. And if you run it, it's a random sample of the data, some like simulated data. And if you run the program again, it will generate another uh, random sample, maybe with different measurement noise or different um, other aspects of the system. So if you are in this situation here, if you can do, if you have a simulator for our model, then this is typically called implicit likelihood model because we don't have we, we don't have a likelihood that we evaluate. We just can sample from it, and if we sample a lo lot and make histograms, we we can um, this we basically can reproduce the underlying like uh, likelihood density. Um, so these are implicit likelihood models, and this would be so examples for this are also the the initial like structure formation simulation that I showed. Then another thing that we can do is likelihood evaluation or log likelihood evalu evaluation. Uh, here, an example is this Galton board, right? So here we would have in the end a program that evaluates a mathematical expression that actually gives us the log likelihood uh, as function of x and z, which is the input, the observation, x, and the parameters, z. And that model then predicts or calculates uh, this single scalar value log of p, okay? So in this case, we have a, if, if you have access to a log likelihood evaluation, we would call this an explicit likelihood model. And, tip, and having a log likelihood evaluation doesn't mean we can sample, and having a sampler doesn't mean we can log likelihood evaluate. These are typically distinct tasks. And it's even reasonably hard to, to figure out whether if you have a simulator and a log likelihood code, whether they do the same thing, whether they correspond to the same distribution. There are things, uh, or there, there's anti-research field <laughs> called probabilistic programming. And the idea of probabilistic programming is in some sense that one writes a simulation code which also acts as a log likelihood evaluator and vice versa. So there, by design of the programming language, actually both things ha are available at the same time. And sometimes one has the score. So the score is the derivative of the log likelihood uh, with respect to model parameters. This can be very useful if one wants to uh, yeah, better explore parameter spaces with some sampling techniques. So uh, subsequently, I will sometimes refer to implicit likelihood models and explicit likelihood models, and uh, sometimes also to probabilistic programming. It turns out that most traditional techniques actually are relying on explicit likelihood models. So you need to write down a mathematical description of your model in order to make progress, and that's often very hard. Whereas modern deep learning-based techniques, and also some classical techniques, actually allow to look at implicit likelihood models. And, and this here is kind of where maybe the future lies of, of modeling observations and also comparing observations with data and method developments in terms of deep learning. Um, questions about that? So um, I, I'm now just going through a few computational approaches, which you also probably have all, all um, seen to some extent, but I want to highlight a few features. So the most naive thing one could do, and actually that was done to, in the end, visualize this posterior for the Galton mod that was jumping around, is to do a grid search, right? So let's say you have a mathematical model for the likelihood, uh, explicit likelihood model. Um, and there's just one parameter, you can just like evaluate that para the likelihood function on a grid for that parameter, right? In 1D, it's fine, it's, it's not that difficult. And you make a plot, and you have the posterior if you normalize it properly. Um, this becomes more and more difficult if you have more and more parameters, right? Uh, because of the curse of dimensionality. In, in 1D, uh, a point just has two neighboring cells, in 2D, it already has eight, eight uh, neighboring cells, and so on. No, so this grows, uh, grows, ex growths. Uh, exponentially, and um, so doing these kind of grid searches over the parameter space to ex find optimal solutions or explore the posterior is not a good idea. Still, it's something that often is actually done, so for instance, for these very heavy, computationally heavy uh, numerical simulations of the universe, you can only afford to run a few of those anyway, so typically one ends up fixing all parameters up to a few and then makes a grid scan over those few parameters. This doesn't give you strict statistically speaking, strict uh, clean results, but it gives typically indicative solutions like, okay, if I change that parameter, this happens, if I change that parameter, this happens. And then you can try to, to extrapolate. Okay, so um, grid-based techniques are can be challenging in that regard and are, are not useful 
in high, very high dimensional settings. Something that is very useful in high dimensional settings when, for instance, doing image analysis tasks would be just map estimation. So here, the idea would be, for instance, we have a, a model for our data. X is data and image maybe, and Z might be some underlying model component. And it might be very hard to sample from the full posterior because the full posterior would be, let's say, thousand dimensional. So you would have a Z corresponds to all the pixels here in this reconstruction image. So dealing with the full posterior would be hard, but you can still turn this an optimization problem and just try to find the, the, the peak of the posterior essentially. So this would be a uh, map estimation. And as an example here, for instance, this is the galactic disk again in gamma rays. We can now try to extract different components from this disk so that have more photons at high energies or more photons at low energies. And if you look at high energies, you see actually this funny uh, bubble-like structure that comes out here in the center. If you look at higher latitudes, th this looks like a bubble. So um, that's not directly visible here in the data, but if one runs map estimation, one can pick this up, for instance. These are Fermi bubbles, quite famous early. And um, Good, so this works very well for high dimensional problems, um, but prior assumptions can be quite, and prior assumptions can be here quite crucial to, to break degeneracies uh, between different outcomes. I, I'm not going much more in this direction, but um, right, techniques here would be if, yeah, conjugate gradient, BFGS, you have to deal with preconditioning gradients to make this efficient and so on. Uh, it's, it's something that is do done a lot in astronomy, but also let's say in imi uh, medical image reconstruction, actually there's a lot of similarity. Um, good, so this has, is another approach. Now, if you want to actually look at posterior samples, the most common way to do this in our field are uh, Markov chain Monte Carlos, or actually nested sampling techniques, which I will not cover here much. I guess you have all seen Markov chain Monte Carlos, right? Race? No. Thanks. Good. So this is a brief recap. Um, so the purpose of Markov chain Monte Carlos is to to essentially generate a, a list of points uh, that eventually converges against samples from the posterior distribution. This works nicely in settings where you have kind of an energy-based model where, where you don't have the normalization of the distribution you want to sample. So, so you, you can use this when, when you have Bayes' theorem, but you don't know P of X. And so that's why it's used a lot. Um, and the, the way this works is, and yeah, you can't really see this well here, but there is like, there, there is a, likelihood function that peaks, or a posterior that peaks in the center, and there's a, um, is it possible to turn off the light maybe in the front? Maybe that helps, I'm not sure. Maybe it switches everything off. Yeah, so can, can you see, can you recognize something here, or is it just completely white? So okay, sir, so okay. So, so you, you see here, you should see here some circles, concentric circles, which indicate like where the probability distribution is large. It's just a uh, standard, Gau no, um, standard Gaussian. And here it's a Gaussian and here's a Gaussian. And so the way this works is now we start somewhere and then uh, from that point we sample, uh, we, we have a, like a proposal step in a specific direction, which is typically also drawn from a Gaussian, more or less. And then this next point is either accepted or rejected. If it's better, it's always accepted. So then the arrow here turns green. If it's worse, then it's accepted. Uh, the proposed point is accepted only with a certain probability, uh, which is proposed. So a target distribution at the proposed point divided by target distribution uh, at the current point. And this defines a Markov chain. Okay, and it turns out that the stationary distribution of this Markov chain happens to be the, the target distribution. And so there are some theoretical guarantees that if you run this long enough, you will actually get samples that are generated, that are effectively drawn from the target distribution. Um, the samples will be not completely independent typically because it's a Markov chain and there are some correlation. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's the process that is used, for instance, to analyze cosmological data and other data sets. And you can see that it's reasonably tedious. So for each of these uh, evaluations of a proposed point, you have to run the simulation. And then uh, if you don't accept the point, you throw away the simulation. If you accept the point, you, you just are like one step further. And you can't reuse simulations directly because if you start a new Markov chain, you start with a new random point and the entire process is random. So it's a very wasteful endeavor, but um, it, it works. And we, we use these chains, for instance, to analyze gravitational wave data and other data sets. Um, so 
uh, if one looks, for instance, at so this doesn't extrapolate well to high dimensions and also to more complicated target distributions. So imagine we have something that m looks more um, like this ring here. Okay, so this donut shaped situation. If you now run the algorithm, and I, I made it a bit faster here, you see that it, in so in principle, if you run this infinite amount of time, we will get nice samples all over the place. But it might take quite a long time. Uh, and so typically, this kind of algorithm or this kind of approach works best if the proposal distribution, so the direction in which you jump and how far you jump, is already comparable to the distribution you want to sample. So ideally, you know already something about the solution to your problem before you start solving it. And that's something actually that is also done when analyzing cosmological data sets. So typically, the first analysis is very, very long. And then you use the results from the first analysis to inform the like proposal distribution for the next one. And you can download it for different data sets and plug it into your analysis. Um, so this is by far the most common way of analyzing a wide range of data sets in, in our field. And it's, um, um, yeah, it's computationally difficult. And OK, having said that, this is just the simplest version. OK, this is a metropolis hastings algorithm. Uh, that I just uh, illustrated here. In principle, one can go quite far beyond this. So there are Gibbs sampling techniques, for instance, which, which basically are an iterative approach to, to uh, look at high dimensional problems. One can do Hamiltonian Monte Carlos, which explore gradient information and better follow uh, the, the, the uh, basically high density regions of the posterior. And there are actually examples where these kind of analysis are done up to, I think the largest things that I know are 10 million dimensions. So depending on the problem, this can work well. But um, in this simple situation, for instance, it, it wouldn't necessarily. Other problems can arise, for instance, if you have multiple peaks, then you have to jump between the peaks. And the probability to jump between peaks uh, or modes in your posterior are, are probably quite low. Good. Um, so um, who has seen plots like this? So that's called a corner plot. Okay, nobody. So, <laughs> um, so uh, what this plot visualizes, so the, the, the problem is the following, right? So imagine we run our Markov chain Monte Carlo, right? And we now have 10 parameters, so we have a, a long list of points in the 10-dimensional parameter space. What, what do we do with it, right? So it's something we can't directly visualize because uh, that, that stops at 3D, typically. Uh, maybe 4D if you do time. Uh, but so... It's, it's hard to visualize directly, uh, but it's also typically not relevant to visualize directly because what all these parameters mean, uh, so all these parameters typically have a physically sp specific physical meaning, right? I uh, mentioned this earlier. Although they might be referred to as latent parameters in some way, they are latent parameters of a physical model, so they have meaning, and they are actually often the parameters we just want to measure. So what we end up doing... Um, in the cosmology community and other communities as well, is to visualize this uh, high-dimensional chain by just projecting it down to, to 1D and 2D uh, posteriors, okay? And so as a, as a simple example, let's look at the subset of the plot here, this, this upper little corner. So let's say we have posteriors that are drawn. Um, so this is a fit to some cosmological data, tells us something about the amount of dark matter and the expansion. Um, the, the, um, yeah, the Hubble rate, so the rate with which the universe expands right now. Um, and so let's suppose we measure, we, we have posterior samples just in this 2D space. Then we can visualize it in at least three ways. So one is to directly plot, basically make a kind of a histogram of, of, these, uh, of these points here, or do density estimation. And then visualize, for instance, the regions which contain 68% of the probability of the posterior. So this would be here this dark uh, red region, or which the region that contains 95% of the posterior, which would be this uh, light red region. And in a Bayesian sense, what these plots would tell us is the probability that the actual parameters lie somewhere in this dark red region is 68%. Okay, and or the 95% in the larger region. So that's one way to visualize it. You see here these other, other colors, they correspond to different uh, experimental combinations. So it's a very common way to plot results like this. 
to test for, let's say, uh, inductive biases of using a different combinations of experiments. You see you get similar results and then you're happy. Um, but we can also now project this down to a 1D, right? So we can just essentially integrate over H0 and end up with a 1D probability distribution uh, just for, the uh, for omega m or vice versa, right? And then these here, th th this plot here contains information basically the same than this, that this plot here, which, what is the value of the parameter that I wanted to measure. And if you have 10 parameters, you do, a, do the same thing for all combinations of parameters, right? So all pairwise combinations are shown here in the non-diagonal part, and on the di diagonal part, we have all the measurements of individual parameters. So what the plot essentially shows is just your measurement result. So measurement of all the parameters and how the parameters are correlated. You see here that there is some correlation between omega m and, and h0. Um, are there questions about this? I, I find these plots extremely useful um, because they give you like a lot of insight about if, if you think about the underlying physical mechanisms, about what parameters are connected with what, and whether there are any things that are fishy, maybe if you see things are correlated that shouldn't, you, you can think more carefully about whether actually your analysis worked or whether you have uh, bugs in the code or whatever. So it, it's very informative in, in that way. Good. I, I will use these kind of plots later on, because uh, they, typi they, they typically represent the, the measurement results that we have in astrophysics. Um, and cosmology. Good. Um, so one thing that we did here was to to marginalize bioemission. Who who has heard about this? I heard about this on Friday. I mean these words, the, the the this way of phrasing it. Who has heard about this before? What what is marginalizing bioemission? Okay. Um, so what what we did here essentially, right, is we have initially a problem which has a large number of parameters, right? Let's say these 10 here. And we had an analysis technique that allowed us to, to deal, to basically sample from this 10-dimensional uh, posterior. But now we want to look at low-dimensional posterior. So we are only interested in one of the parameters. And so the question is how, how to get there. And there are essentially two ways how to get from a large model with many degrees of freedom, with many parameters, to samples from a simple model. And one of these paths tends to be easier than the other, typically. Okay, so th that, that's very generic. So let's say we have a probability distribution with three parameters, x, y, z. This doesn't have to be data or observations or anything. This ju just three numbers, x, y, z. Then, um, and we want to get samples we just want to get samples from uh, p of x, from the marginal distribution of x, okay? We don't care about the rest. There are two ways to get there. Um, one is to somehow integrate over y and z. And that might be possible if p of x, y, z is simple enough, if it's Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian or something, you, you know how to do this, and you can get results. Or you can maybe numerically do it, okay? And then you end up with a new function, p of x. You still have to figure out how to sample it, but if, it's, if it happens to be Gaussian, this will be straightforward. You generate samples, and, and you are done, OK? So th this, this is a strategy that can be simple if that integration here is tractable, ideally if it's analytical. The other strategy would be to first sample from this high-dimensional model, which can be difficult in the first place. But once you did this, the only thing that you have to do is to omit now y and z, okay? So you, you have a list of values x, y, z, which are your samples, and you just forget about y and z. Then you get the list of x's. And this also gives you samples from p of x, okay? And that's just due to the trivial fact that you can write p of x, comma y, comma z uh, as marginal distribution of p of x, and then conditional distribution of y and z given x, okay? Um, Good. Why, why am I telling you this? Well, this this will become relevant. This became relevant just on the last slide, but it will be also quite relevant in the second part of the lecture when we talk about efficiencies for deep learning-based inference techniques. Because some inference techniques kind of work more like this, and some more like this. And in the end, we often just interested in measuring one parameter, and not all the million parameters that we might have in our model. Good. So how did this? Uh, and okay. So if we now go back to this slide here, 
um, a Markov chain, Markov chain Monte Carlo from the previous slide, actually generated a list of like uh, ten-dimensional points, right? So the way we generated these plots here was to just omit eight of the parameters and then just make a histogram for the two parameters that we care about, or the one parameter that we care about. Okay. Um, Good questions about that. I, th I think we will be done in 15 minutes, and then we have a coffee break. So, yep. Like, uh, how many parameters do you usually have? Because like this seems to be feasible when you have like 10 of these or 20. But what's like in, in case of like deep learning, it's common to have like I don't know 100,000 parameters or yep. more. So this becomes quite infeasible then. Yeah. Um, you you are specifically talking about this here, or okay? Yeah, I can show. That that's a very good question. So, as I mentioned, there are situations where you can do this up to a hundred million parameters. With a, so the example that I have in mind here, I don't have a slide for this. Is using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to infer the initial density fluctuations of the universe from the galaxy distributions to date. It's quite impressive work which looks like really, really difficult because you have to train, a, uh, you have to tune a Hamilton the proposal distributions of a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to make this really work efficiently. They don't talk much about computational resources that they need, but it works. So it's, it's, it's impressive and you can really go to high dimensions, but the challenge is that this, I mean, one challenge is this works pretty well if everything is Gaussian, right? If, you have, if, if the posterior is the standard normal Gaussian and if your proposal distribution is the standard normal Gaussian, this will just work brilliantly up to arbitrary dimensions. But um, if, if you are deviating from that, more and more this becomes very complicated. And this here is just complicated already in 2D. So it depends very much on the situation. And in some sense, I try to convince you maybe in the second part of the lecture that we need methods that don't scale in this way. And deep learning probably is, is going to provide them in specific ways. Let me just show you an example where actually 30 dimensions are already a problem. So this here is gravitational wave data analysis. So let's say this here are two overlapping. Okay, I, I mentioned gravitational waves as an example early on, right? So two merging, let's say, black holes produce uh, one of these time series signals, and we have to infer, the task is to infer uh, a bunch of parameters from these observations. And typically one wants to infer roughly 15 parameters, which parameterize where on the sky the event happened, how far away did it happen, uh, what's the mass of the initial black holes, how were, uh, how were they oriented with respect to us, um, what's their intrinsic spin maybe, and so on. So you end up with 15 parameters, roughly speaking. And if you run uh, MCMC, this takes like a week or something, and then you have a result, and then you can publish it. Um, but so, so a week is still feasible, right? And um, there are nowadays deep learning based techniques that make this much, much, much faster. Um, but traditionally, uh, the, the results are still based in these big collaborations on MCMC because it's like the, the proven way of doing things. Um, but, if, but in the future, there will be more, the experiments will become so sensitive that there will be more and more cases where you actually observe two gravitational wave signals on top of each other, just by coincidence. And then if you want to make sense out of the data, you suddenly have 30 parameters, not 15 anymore. And that's a, that's a problem. So if you run then the MCMC chain, in this particular case, it takes like up to six months. And in the future, we will have more, more events, right? The experiments will become better, so we see more gravitational wave signals, not less. And there's a real need for actually figuring out how to deal with that data. And in the far future, there are space-based gravitational wave detectors where the idea is that you can see a large number of signals that are all overlapping, essentially. And you're interested in measuring the in individually plus everything that is below that that you can't resolve. And these are open analysis ch uh, challenges. And you certainly are not, so that's certainly not happening with MCMC. Um, right. So I, I made, this is a plot that I just made up for like visualization purposes. So, so imagine you have now a 50 dimensional inference problem, right? Um, you, you basically have to sample some probability distribution in 50D. Um, which can be difficult if it's if you're in a situation where even maybe some two-dimensional subset of this becomes difficult. And you have to do this even if the only interest is, okay, I want to measure this parameter Z1. Maybe that's like the thing I want to measure. I, I don't really care about the rest. You still are first doing all the rest and then get this one. So you, 
first have to solve, in some sense, this full joint inference problem for all the parameters. And then once you solve this very hard problem, you do marginalization by omission, right? And you suddenly end up with, with a posterior for this one parameter. So that, that's very frustrating. Um, and um, you see here, for so as I said, the scaling actually depends very much on the situation. This here is from a paper uh, about polycord, which is a specific nested sampling code that is used for these tasks. So here they show that, and uh, so here it's actually supposed to be a very positive message. So here they show that the number of uh, simulations that you need to run for a 50 dimension parameter space would be around 100 million, which is not great if each simulation takes a second, right? Not, not to speak of like maybe a minute or two, because then you are waiting days, uh, years or, or decades. So, so that's, that's a serious problem uh, one has to face. And whoop. so questions about this? I, I will now talk more about solutions. So that, but I want to first set up what's the problem. Okay, so I, I said typically, and I come back to this, so typically um, what we do here is we first analyze the full problem and then at the second step we do marginalization by omission, right? So it would be nice if one could actually invert this, if one could do first somehow marginalization by omission and then only do the inference task on the low dimensional problem that you actually care about. This, this sounds like it should be easier. And there is actually a classical example called approximate Bayesian computation that actually does this. Uh, who has heard about approximate Bayesian computation? Okay. It's here as unpopular as it is uh, in physics and astronomy. So it's, it's an awesome thing, and that actually it's the thing that connects most to deep learning-based techniques. But traditionally, it has been very difficult to use. So approximate Bayesian computation doesn't rely on having a likelihood model uh, or an explicit likelihood model. But instead, it relies on having a simulator. Ex an, uh, imp yeah, so it doesn't rely on explicit likelihood models, but on a simulator, on an explicit likelihood, uh, implicit likelihood model. Sorry. So we need a simulator. Let's assume we have this. And then we can exploit Bayes' theorem. So we want to somehow sam get a handle on the posterior here, right? So P of Z given X. Um, so doing this here is hard. We take some observation sample from the posterior. But, um, so we want to do back uh, inference, but it turns out that actually running our simulator is reasonably simple in the sense that we can at least do it, right? So we have our physical model, we plug in parameters, and we get results. So the idea is in some sense to do a lot of the forward simulations to and then use base, yeah, and then invert this and, and get in, uh, results for an inference task. And the way this works is as follows. So let's suppose we have, uh, we, we so that might be high dimensional, but we pick just one parameter, right? It's kind of marginalization by omission. We pick one parameter, let's say the first component, which I plot here at the x-axis. And then let's suppose we have some sufficient data summary. Data summary is essentially something that takes x, our high dimensional image or whatever, and compresses it in a single number that ideally is correlated with the parameter we care about, right? And the better the correlation, the tighter, uh, the, the better the data summary. So um, what we can then do is we'll run the simulator many times and just populate this, this green band here. And this can look differently in different situations, but here it's, it's this green band. And then we store this somewhere. And now le let's say there is some observation that we get in, right? So we get some x naught as an observation. We just plug this in our data summary calculator. This gives us a t, so some value t. And then we read off this band here uh, this 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 uh, list of points in a specific epsilon region around this data summary, okay? And then we make a histogram. So that's the histogram of these points. That's the easiest way or the, the most naive or traditional way of doing approximate Bayesian computation. And in the limit where epsilon goes to zero and where you have a very large number of simulations, this year will, uh, will um, asymptote against the true posterior of the problem. And that's pretty cool. Um, because you can do this for, I mean, once you have the simulations, right, you can actually do this for all individual parameters, right? So you get instantaneously measurement results for all the parameters you are interested in. You can reuse simulations. So if you have other measurements, actually you can just use the same simulations and get instantaneously new posteriors. That's called amortized in the machine learning world. 
And um, the only down, um, so the, the difficult part of this approach here is you need to have smart data summaries. You need to have data summaries that are correlated with the parameter that you're interested in. Traditionally, this has been super difficult because you have to think very hard about what would be an optimal way of summarizing your data into some, something low dimensional. But that's where deep learning will start playing a role because neural, deep neural nets happen to be very efficient in turning anything into a data summaries, well, yeah, in pattern recognition essentially, which is this here. Yeah. Uh, no, this is not. This will not be bijected. So the, the data summary should be ideally a sufficient summary in the sense that it extracts all information from the data that it could. So or in, in the sense that basically the posterior here wouldn't it, that there is no better data summary. No, no better way to summarize the data that would give give a tighter constraint, uh, tighter measurement of the uh, parameter you care about uh, than the data summary you have. So there is some notion of sufficient or optimal data summaries. Uh, but the data summary would be here in this case, for instance, um, uh, one dimensional. You could have also higher dimensional data summaries. In the end, this is a bit related to mutual information. So you want to maximize the mutual information between the parameters you care about and um, the data summary. And you can set up, yeah, I, I will come to that. Okay, um, yeah, no, sorry. More questions about this year? We will was there more? No. Okay. Um, right. So let's compare MCMC and approximate Bayesian computation and ABC. So for likelihood model, we need explicit. Uh, right. Sorry. Yeah. For MCMC, we need an explicit likelihood model, right? Um, or not necessarily a likelihood model. So it has to be can be an energy model. So in the sense that we don't have the normalizing factor of the likelihood. That's fine. Uh, for ABC, we need a simulator. We need an implicit likelihood model. Okay. The problem with ABC is which requires data summaries. For MCMC, we don't care. We just have the likelihood. But with ABC, we can easily do margin, what I call here marginal inference. So we can directly infer the one parameter or the two or three that we care about, and while while still dealing correctly with the all the ones that we don't care about. So we can neglect the ones we don't care about. It's also what's called amortized. So once we trained ABC, we can actually quite efficiently test it, right? So it gives us instantaneously answers. We can just plug in a lot of other simulated data, let's say test data, and see if the results actually are correct. Uh, whereas with MCMC, we can't do that. Um, right, and MCMC is, but the upside of MCMC is, is targeted. So once your simulator runs, at some point, the, all the proposals typically will be close to regions in the parameter space where the probability density is high. So you will run more simulations that are similar to the observation, whereas for ABC you would just draw from the full prior. So in the second part of the lecture I will essentially talk about like modern AI versions of this. So MCMC will in some sense turn a bit into variational inference and ABC will in some sense turn a bit into something called uh, neural posterior estimation or simulation based inference or Inference compilation, so there are all kinds of words for this. Um, right, before, mm. I think I talked now for 90 minutes, right? So it's probably about time to stop. I, I have two more slides, maybe I go briefly through them. <laughs> you still have some time. So it yeah. yeah, yeah, I know, but uh, people are exhausted, including me. So <laughs> simplified approximate about it. So I just want to make the point, uh, and I'm not going into details here. With traditional techniques, right, MCMC, the problem is analyzing a large number of parameters isn't easy at all. So typically, one approach to deal with reality and the, the real data is you just fix parameters, and then you run the analysis for the parameters that you leave free, and then you get some estimate for those parameters, and you fix them, and then you analyze the, the other part, and then you do this like an iterative scheme. So expectation maximization algorithms, for instance, work like this. But we do this also when analyzing very difficult data sets, simply because there's no better way to do it. But it's but a, like getting a handle on these conditional distributions isn't the same thing as getting a handle on the actual marginal distributions. So it's very hard to control errors here. And like people typically, depending on the field, have then opinions about what works and what not. Um, Good, but here a gamma ray example would be, for instance, to analyze point sources, you need to know the background. But to, in order to need to know the background, you need to subtract the point sources. So it's like chicken and egg problem in some sense, and, and it's just difficult. 
Um, there are other ways if things are Gaussian, you can integrate them out. I had here an example, but, but I'm not going into details. So if, if some of the parameters are Gaussians, if your priors are ga Gaussian, you might play some integration tricks. But the better the data, the, the worse the approximation sometimes, if actually your Gaussian approximation isn't fully correct. And so that's like the last plot, I think. So there is some weird dynamics in our field <laughs> that, that forces people to keep their models simple, which has to do with the fact that if you have more and more model details, the, Im the, the simulation or the, the inference costs just explode, right? So you, you try to keep your models when analyzing data as simple as possible to like get a result before your PhD uh, thesis is over. And but if you keep your model too simple, you actually lose out on science because there are some types of analysis you can't do anymore because maybe your signals are below the systematic uncertainties of your simplified model. So you settle on some like intermediate minimum where you lose some science and you have still low costs. But if you like increase observing more and more data, what happens is that you need more parameter which like moves this minimum to more lost science and to higher simulation costs. So what we yeah. And what we need and what I will talk about in, in the next part of this lecture is tools that actually get the break the scaling law, okay? That allow us to analyze data with very high quality, with very high precision, but don't penalize us for actually having realistic models for the data. And you can yeah, okay, it's a visualization of this process. So if the scaling law, the costs for high dimensional model analysis would be much lower we actually would much have a much easier time to more accurately model data, but also to get results with much lower costs. And that's what the second part of the lecture will be about. Yeah, so that, that was the first part. I think we can now maybe like continue a bit with Q&A um, for a short time and then break for coffee. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot, Christoph. Any questions? Uh, hi. Uh, so thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so I have a question um, because, like, uh, in your like story and the examples that you've shown, like, uh, especially in the first part, uh, it seemed that like typically uh, it is the case that you have like some kind of uh, graphical model that like you already have. Uh, is it like Typical for the like problems that you work on, or do you need to kind of like also infer this this graph uh, yourself? And like, what tools would you use yeah. for that? So I should start with saying that it's a, it's very uncommon in our community to think about all these analysis in terms of graphical models. So that usually these models are never written down in that way, and. Um, but okay, if, if people would write down their, their kind of graphical models, which always tend to analyze these, these analysis, they often would quite differ because different groups m have to make different assumptions, use different algorithms to s and ap approximation schemes to solve these inference tasks. So actually graphical models could be quite interesting in order to represent this. Um, what's even more interesting, I think, is that there should be, for most data sets, a way to actually write down the true graphic model in some sense, with all its complexity. Um, but it's, it's basically never done, because even if you could write down this full graphic model, there wouldn't be any techniques up to now, at least, to, to analyze it. So for, so, for instance, looking at graphic models is a, is a topic that probabilistic programming people care a lot about. Um, so you can think about these graphic models as a probabilistic program. But when when discussing something like the the graphical model that I had for Fermi data with people who actually work on probabilistic programming, this looks m far larger than anything they actually deal with. So um, there are the two sides that, in principle, there are graphic models, small ones that underlie different analysis, and they will different look look differently even for the same data sets for different groups. But in principle, there should be an overall model that cap encapsulates everything we know and don't know accurately that we ideally could compare with data, but yeah, that's not done. But I hope in the future maybe this becomes more common. Did this answer the, the question? Okay. So once again, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had two questions. Uh, first of all, what's the level of 
granularity of the simulations uh, about the evolution of the universe. So what, what do you model? Um, atoms? Yeah. I should say that, that I, I don't run these simulations myself. So my oh main okay. background is um, was in the past gamma ray astrophysics. Now I've worked a lot on uh, strong lensing images. Um, the simulations are done by colleagues, and uh, the one that I showed, um, if I remember correctly, so it's an adaptive mesh simulation, so the resolution actually scales with the gas density, which is important because most of the universe is pretty empty, so you need an adaptive mesh. Um, and then the resolution, if I remember correctly, goes, it doesn't tell you much, but goes down to uh, tens of parsecs, so parsec is... Um, four light years, roughly. So it goes down to like uh, this a scale that wh where you can not resolve individual stars, but star-forming regions, for instance. And yeah, it's an adaptive mesh simulation. So um, uh, the total number of mesh grids is, I think, of the order of 10 or 20 billion in the largest simulations. Yeah. Okay. And the second one is um, how robust are the methods you propose? Like y you you kind of went through for over the lecture because like with uh with deep learning we we know that uh it's it's kind of easy to uh fall into some attractors and the model to collapse um what are like on the other hand how robust are these more traditional methods uh against these attractors um Okay, I have not to guess a bit what you mean with attract. So wha one thing, for instance, for, for general, so are you thinking about like mode collapse for guns, for instance? As an example? Yeah, yeah. We're okay, good. Yeah. Um, so one advantage here in some sense is that we have our simulation models, right? We don't need to train a gun to simulate uh, something. In some sense, we, we don't have that problems on the simulator side. So the modes that are there are there implicitly in the simulator model as it is. Now, if you run an inference pipeline, for instance, MCMC, it could happen that there is and it does happen in some cases, it could happen that there are lots of local minima. So you don't have one, but you have a lot, like thousands of them. And there are nice examples also from gravitational waves where if you look at the data like in spectrograms, then it looks like a, like a fence somehow, and you can like align the fence in multiple ways to have partially matching results. And this is called needle in a haystack problem. It's one of these unsolved problems where if you do this in a likelihood-based approach, you end up with thousands of minima and you get stuck somewhere with the algorithms. Whereas with simulation-based inference, it should be quite trivial to, to get the correct answer. Um, so the traditional methods have like a lot of pitfalls, but they are typically known because they are around since many decades, partially. And so people got used to that and, and deal with that. Thank you very much. So I want to ask you about the visualization of the posteriors. So how uh, independent should be your parameter? Because I think if you simulate it, so you know that you put some parameters that are in independent, but if you take it from the data, then maybe your guess is wrong and it's could one parameter could be rely on other parameters that you have in your data. So how is it working? Yeah, so for the, um, in some sense, the idea is that if, if you do everything right, right? So if, no, what does this do? So if, if your chain, let's say, is completely convergent, you have a list of independent samples from, let's say, your uh, 10 dimensional parameter space, if you then project it down in, in 1D or, or 2D, automatically all the correlations with um, with other parameters should be integrated out and, integ and taken into account. So for instance, you can s can see this here a bit. So at least the blue contour seems to, I'm not sure, uh, it's the green one maybe. Uh, it's a bit correlated, right? So uh, omega m and h naught are here correlated. And so this also, if you look at the 1D posterior, shows up as this green line, it's hard to see, it being actually a bit wider. So the fact that the parameters are somewhat degenerate means that, yeah, you can't, you it's harder to measure one of them individually, right? It would help to know for sure one of the parameters and then you could get a better constraint on the other. So, so the fact that they are partially degenerate shows up in the larger measure measuring un measurement uncertainty for an individual parameters when, when doing the integration. Um, so th that, that's actually quite important to take fully into account. And there are methods that like running a full MCMC chain that should do this properly, but often, as yeah, um, the problems become so large that you are forced to 
fix one of the parameters or some of the parameters, and then it's easy to end up with too narrow results, basically overconfident results. Yeah. Um, going back to the um, data analysis approach, so you mentioned that combining all the um, methods would require to run them simultaneously, right? So is there a system in place that could do this theoretically right now? Or um, is it just a theoretical yeah, approach? That's a very good question, and I try to convince you that, that we got something that probably works that way in the second part of the lecture. Uh, but yeah, so it, it's difficult in some sense. So I, I think it's not possible to try to estimate the full joint posterior um, and yeah, odd, not, not oddly enough, but interestingly enough, that's typically the goal when people try to scale up inference algorithms to more realistic models. So I think that's hard, but I think what's possible, what seems possible is to break down the problem systematically into simpler components, solve them, but solve them in a way that you still get, um, uh, let me go, sorry, there are too many animations. Um, so solve them in a way that you don't end up with this year, but end actually up with this year in a consistent way. So with full marginal posteriors. Um, and in that sense, it would allow you to run all these analysis in, in some sense in parallel. So you would run them separately, but they would run self-consistently. And yeah, that's something I will talk about in the second part. Yeah, well, thanks. Hmm? Okay, so as you introduce this notion of sufficient statistic, uh, ah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, if we operate on this kind of image, uh, this gamma ray image, you probably get a lot of like co correlated regions as we normally do with in the images. So, do you uh, introduce some, I don't know, uh, local compression so you extract these uh, sufficient statistics of regions and then? Uh, perform like inference and obtain the model on this or, or you do it directly on the data? So the way this will work, I, I will discuss this in the second lecture, the way this eventually works is um, that you train an inference network that tries to essentially yeah, approximate the, the posteriors directly, marginal posteriors. And so let's, let's look for instance at this year, this posterior and you would have a data compression step or like an embedding where X is embedded, let's say in a CNN or something like this, which spits then out a single data summary or 10 or something, which would then help to, to, to get a posterior for Z. And what happens is if, if one sets the problem correctly up, uh, that the data summary turns into something that like m uh, the minimizes the entropy, for instance, of the posterior or maximizes the distance between the adjacent Shannon divergence of posterior and prior, or things like that. So there are some specific notions in which the, the um, data summaries become optimal. But it's, it's yeah, there are various approaches in the literature. There are also people who first cr create data summaries using some um, like uh, Fisher information arguments, for instance, to maximize the information of a data summary, and then use this for inference. The, the things that I here talk about do basically everything at once, because neural nets can do that. Any other questions? We have time for one more. Well, if not, uh, then it's time for a coffee break. Um, everyone's very excited for that, I'm sure. Um, so the coffee should be right outside the door, um, I think. And yeah, feel free to also walk around the campus, use the sun. I think it's gonna rain tomorrow, so it must be last chance. Um, so, I, I think you can hear me well. If it's too loud, let me know. Good, so the second part of the lecture will be now how to tackle the problems and analysis challenges that are... It's a bit louder, right? Or is it fine like this or too loud? No. Okay, good. Good, so this will be now about how we tackle... Yeah, what, what we actually to do now with deep learning, right? There wasn't much machine learning up to now. Uh, in what I discussed, so I set the stage. Uh, 
what I discussed was, okay, we have large, what I call large forward models, right? You can think about them as these large graphical models with a lot of parameters. Um, we want to do Bayesian inference. X and Z can be quite complicated, right? Might be a list of very large, um, of, of, uh, of a large number of parameters, maybe very high dimensional. And we want to ideally be in a situation where we end up with inference techniques that break this annoying scaling law, which uh, penalizes high dimensional and realistic models that actually describe the data th that we see. Good, so what the lecture will be about is I, I will start with different techniques of estimating the posterior using uh, the kurbach leipler divergence or kurbach leipler divergence based approaches. Uh, this will connect with things you have heard about like uh, variational autoencoders for instance and uh, maybe, yeah, I, I guess variational autoencoders are the most well-known examples. Then, um, there, there, yeah, this is the entire research field, uh, so how to do efficient posterior estimations. So I will just highlight a few general aspects. And then I will discuss our twist on it. So we have we invented an algorithm called beautifully truncated marginal neural ratio estimation. Um, and I will explain what this is, what problems we try to solve, and then applications to three or four examples. And then the vision is kind of inference assembly. This is also a term that I made up to describe like a process and a problem that we want to solve. Um, again, ask questions. Um, there are a lot of examples I want to discuss. I don't have to get through all of them, so just ask questions. We will stay in time, so after 85 minutes, there will be another break. And, and probably I will stop a bit earlier for more Q&A. Good, so posterior estimation with uh, the kurbach leipert divergence. Okay, what, what do we want to do? Well, we go back to Bayes' theorem as so often. This is Bayes' theorem, posterior likelihood prior and Bayesian evidence. So let's suppose we want to use a neural net to, to make progress with applying uh, Bayes' theorem. And let's assume what we want to do, for, for reasons that will become clear, is to actually approximate some of these factors here that appear, uh, appear in Bayes' theorem with a neural net, okay? Then there are a few options. So we can try to approximate the likelihood function with the neural net. So I think the reason to do this would be neural nets are, are much faster to evaluate than a full simulator. So if we can estimate the likelihood function with the neural net, we could actually run Markov chain Monte Carlos afterwards much faster. We could directly try to, to approximate the posterior with a neural net. So if we manage to do that, we might have a, um, an inference network that allows us to just, it works a bit like ABC, so we throw in data, we immediately get the posterior out. We could also try to estimate any other combinations of these factors, including, for instance, the ratio between likelihood and prior, uh, sorry, likelihood and evidence, Bayesian evidence. We call this ratio here just ratio, so that's likelihood to evidence ratio estimation, and you can write this particular ratio in different ways, like the likelihood divided by the Bayesian evidence, or the posterior divided by the prior, it's like connected by a Bayes theorem, uh, or you can write it as the joint distribution divided by the marginals, okay? These are all just equivalent expressions for the same thing. Good, the vast majority of literature about using deep learning for inference tasks is actually about either posterior estimation or likelihood estimation, but there's also a niche of people who do neural ratio estimation, and we are part of that niche, so first, I will describe the more traditional approaches, at least on a very general level, and, and their features, and how, this, how they connect to likelihood-based and simulation-based inference, and then I will get to neural ratio estimation, okay? Okay, so for now, let's, let's focus on uh, neural posterior estimation. So the task, we want to fit a neural network to represent the posterior, okay? And the, the, the reason why we want to do this uh, will become clear in a second. So, the, But the first thing, if you want to fit anything against anything, we need a, something that quantifies how close we are, right? So we need a distant measure. And uh, the most common starting point, although there could be others, and there are others, is the kullback leipler divergence. Who has seen the kullback leipler Right, so that's very different in the physics audience. Um, so kullback leipler divergence looks like this. It's uh, it's not a metric, it's a divergence, so it measures the basically a difference between two probability density functions. Here it's the kullback leipler divergence from P to Q. And let's say P is the posterior that we want to fit, and Q 
is the fitting function. It's something parameterized by a deep neural net in some way. We will later discuss how to parameterize it and what are examples. One can show now that the kullback leibler divergence is uh, non-negative and it's only zero if p actually equals q and otherwise it's larger. So it's, it's a good starting point for a loss function, right? If you could write this as a loss function, we write it as a loss function, minimizing that loss was, would give us uh, a network q of phi that represents p. Now the problem is we can't evaluate the components that are here, so we actually can't evaluate the posterior, otherwise we would be done and so on. Um, so I, I will talk about how we can extend this in various ways. And the, the reason why we might be interested in this is efficiently, uh, efficiency, for instance, right? So training, maybe the training of the neural net requires fewer simulations than actually running MCMC. Then we, we gain like in a simulation efficiency. Maybe this actually scales better to higher model complexity or dimensionality. And maybe we can all use all the great tools that have been developed in context of deep learning over the last 10 years uh, to solve now suddenly physics and uh, astronomy inference tasks. So there are many reasons to, to use this as a starting point. Now, one, oh, is the slide missing or what happened? Ah, no, I put the slide here. Right, so one, one important thing is um, now that the ingredients in this, in this uh, that, that we plug in here into the kullback leibler divergence, the, the Q has and P have to be normalized probability density functions. We can't just plug any arbitrary neural net which would give real valued output because probability density cannot be negative and it has to be normalized to one, right? So we want actually that whatever network we plug in there is non-negative and that it has the, the property that if you integrate over Z, we get one. And that's quite non-trivial, right? You can't just, I mean, you could have MLP, uh, MLP and just exponentiate it and then always integrate and, and divide by the integral. But there are many ways to do this in an inefficient way. Uh, a very efficient way that is also very popular is using normalizing flows. I'm not gonna, much into, gonna go much into details here, but the basic idea is to start with a tractable, simple base density, typically a standard normal distribution, and then apply a sequence of a tractable, um, invertible operations with, with tractable Jacobian that allows you to then efficiently go from here to here, from here to here, and evaluate densities in the transformed space. So if, if you do this, um, you end up with yeah, fitting functions, essentially to density functions that allow you to fit, for instance, data that might look like this with a glow-based model, or here I took a block neural autoregressive flows. There are many versions of autoregressive, uh, of normalizing flows. This is just one of the examples. You see that the network can learn well to approximate some uh, distributions, but if, if, yeah, basically it does it by, you can nicely see this here, by stretching a Gaussian into components. You see here how this is stretched and that there are actually connections between the uh, individual regions. So depending on how well these transformations work, the approximations can work well. Anyway, I'm not going to much into details here. I'm not talking about network architectures, but about the underlying concepts. So let's assume we, we have a fitting function that works like this, okay? Could be also just a Gaussian, yeah? Um, the physics will come in, uh, so in some sense, this here will be, the P will be based on our simulation model. So P will be eventually the posterior, which is related through Bayes' theorem with a simulation model, with a likelihood model, and this is where, where the physics happens. The, the inference part itself is completely physics-free in some sense. Yes, right, so the, the assumption is there is a simulator uh, physics simulate, yeah, some simulation model P of X given Z. So the, our likelihood model that for a given parameter Z predicts us the probability of a specific data set. And this can be either an explicit or an implicit likelihood model. So either a simulator or a likelihood evaluation model. And that's the starting point. And this model then defines in some sense the posterior that we want to fit. So the, the entire, f so I assume here, and there, there are other approaches to this, but I assume here that all the physics is happening in the simulator, in the likelihood, and that the inference pipeline should be agnostic mostly uh, about that and just do its job, essentially. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's assume that now that we have such network and that it works well, okay? Um, 
now we have two choices. And they are related to the fact that the KL divergence is not symmetric. Okay? So the KL of P to, uh, from Q is not, it's not the same as DKL of Q to uh, from P. And this leads to essentially two choices that lead to a different, completely different set of algorithms. And I will talk through both, because both types of algorithms have pros and cons, and in some sense relate more to traditional likelihood-based methods and traditional simulation-based methods. I should say that the words that I wrote here below these choices uh, are not uniform, so sometimes, okay, I, I first tell you what I wrote. So this here is what is called the uh, reverse KL divergence. It's just how it's called in this context. And this leads to uh, what, what is commonly denoted as variation and inference. It's likelihood-based. Um, this here is the forward, is typically called forward KL divergence. This leads to something that one might want to call neural posterior estimation. It's typically simulation-based. Um, the way, so the, the names that these approaches or un ansatzes have depends apparently very strongly on community. So some people would call this here also variational inference, forward variational inference. Some would be not very happy me say, calling this here likelihood based and so on. But for now, let's just ignore nomenclature and start with these equations, right? And I will, I think I will start, right, I will start with variational inference, explain you how this works. Who has seen variational autoencoders before? Okay, good. So this is a version of a variational autoencoder without uh, the encoder, no, without the decoder part. Um, and this here is uh, neural posterior estimation. I, I will talk about this in a second. Good, so variational inference. Let's, let's start with the um, KL divergence, as it's shown here, KL from Q to P. And we write it here as an integral over our network Q, our flow-based model Q, times the log ratio of Q to P. Okay? Now, this is an expression that has a lot of ingredients that are hard to calculate. We can't calculate the, I mean, the, doing the integral would be hard, but also evaluating the posterior density might be quite hard, because in order to calculate the posterior density, we need the likelihood model and we need normalization. We need the Bayesian evidence. Okay, but we can get to something that actually is tractable in uh, various steps. So the first step is re replace this integral here by just writing it equivalently in as, an ex as an expectation value over random draws from the uh, target function from our variation of posterior Q phi, okay? And so that's the first step. We can then Monte Carlo estimate this, uh, this log ratio here if you want. Um, and then um, the next step is to exploit Bayes' theorem and substitute the post t take the posterior and replace it by the likelihood times prior divided by the evidence. Okay, we can simply do it. So we get then here KL divergence uh, averaged over random draws from the variational uh, posterior, and then we get here the log ratio. Okay, this is still the intractable thing up here. So we get the log ratio between the variational posterior and the true posterior that we can't evaluate. And now we plug in Bayes' theorem and we replace the true posterior with these two tractable quantities. So one is the likelihood model and one is the prior. And then we get this intractable base, uh, uh, Bayesian evidence, which, we, which doesn't depend, however, on Z. So we can just pull it out and forget about it. The reason why we can forget about it is because it doesn't depend on phi. Right? So if you try to use this ansatz here to actually minimize uh, the, uh, the kohlbach leibler divergence, this constant term here doesn't play a role. And whatever is left here is then called um, evidence lower bound, minus evidence lower bound, actually. And the very reason why that's the case is because we have a lower bound on the KL divergence, the elbow becomes a lower bound actually on this intractable uh, log uh, evidence. Okay? So that's why it's called evidence lower bound. If you think about the derivation, the same derivation for variational autoencoders, the main difference is that you also would vary here or integrate over uh, random data examples, right, over X0. X0 wouldn't just be a single observation, but it would be like your training data, right? And you would have, um, you would, yeah, and you would have a, um, a uh, what, how's the lower part called? Reconstruction network or whatever. So, um, that, that would then allow you to compare to data. Again. So we, we, don't, we don't have this here. Um, 
Good. So that's the starting point. Now we can write the elbow um, in various ways to just visualize or better understand what it actually means. Um, so we have so one way to write it is simply to pull out this like you term here and regroup the rest so that it turns into a kullback leibler diversion. So the first term here, so remember we want to maximize elbow. If you want to minimize the KL, the first term will uh, favor regions of the parameter space that produce a, a high log likelihood for the data, x naught. So that's good. And the second term will basically penalize having uh, being too different if, if the difference between the posterior and the prior becomes too large. So basically it will drag, it, it will avoid overfitting because uh, the prior is, the, the fitted posterior uh, is dragged back towards the prior. And you can also write this in a slightly different way, like this here, where the first term is likelihood function, it favors good fit to the data. Second term is the, uh, it favors, the fit favors a high prior probability. And the last term uh, corresponds to the entropy of the variational posterior and, and penalizes overfitting. Okay, um, this here is a visualization that I took from one of my colleagues, Luca Ambrosioni in Nijmegen. Um, so you can see here the elbow again, likelihood, prior, and entropy. And if you imagine this here is the likelihood function, this here is the um, this here is the prior. <laughs> this here is the prior, and um, then we are interested in actually fitting it. But the, the way this would work is we would sample from the uh, variational posterior. We would get these red samples here. And then there would be a pull towards the samples. So the, the samples would be pulled in the direction of the likelihood. They would also be pulled in the direction of the prior. And they would repel each other because of this entropy term here. So you see this here visualized by the, by the yellow lines. The way this is done in practice is using the reparameterization trick because you have to kind of deal with optimizing parameters that are in your sampling distribution. Um, and I assume you have all seen this if you have like had a variation autoencoder somewhere taught during your career up to now. Um, so that's how, how the setup works. Are there questions about that for now? Seems to be very un uncontroversial. So what, what you need for this is actually a likelihood model, right? So this works only for um, M for explicit likelihood models, because you need to evaluate likelihoods. And in order to optimize this, you also need the score of the model uh, to, in order to use the reparameterization trick. So actually, you need a reasonably sophisticated likelihood model where you are able to both evaluate the likelihood and you are able to evaluate the derivative of the likelihood with respect to, to the model parameters you care about. Okay. So, so maybe I should clarify here what I was confusing this a bit before. So the decoder part in the variation autoencoder is here essentially replaced by our physical model. Okay, so we need a physical model in, in re that replaces the decoder of the variational autoencoder, and the decoder of a variational autoencoder is differentiable, which you need in order to, to optimize the entire story. Here, so also our physics simulator would have to be differentiable, and we need to be able to calculate gradients with respect to that. Okay, so that's um, how variational inference works, and I, I will come back to that in a second. Um, then we can look at this other ansatz, which is forward KL divergence. Okay, now the starting point is that we start with the KL from P to Q. The only difference is now that we, or the differences are now that the um, that here in the log we we uh, swapped uh, the ratio components, and the prefactor is not now our variational posterior, but the true posterior of, of the model, right? And again, we can write this now as uh, an expectation over random samples from this true posterior, um, and what we average is the log ratio between true posterior and variational posterior, okay? Now, this again uh, contains a bunch of intractable quantities. So we can't easily generate samples from the posterior, otherwise we would be done, right? That's um, our goal in the end. And also, we cannot evaluate easily the posterior density because if you could, yeah, because for this we need again to um, know the Bayesian evidence. So the problem is 
here, or the challenge is how to avoid sampling from this intractable posterior. And the trick that is now used is, is quite interesting because it's basically uh, extending the problem to an e even larger problem. Um, namely, we, what we are going to do is to extend the problem of getting training a neural network and fitting it uh, to a single posterior for a single observation. We extend the problem such that we train a neural network to deal with all kinds of possible observations. So instead of looking at just at a single observation, X0, we take the KL averages and now also average over all, um, random draws from the, from the, um, from, from the um, uh, Bayesian evidence, so from our simulation model. And the way we would generate these random draws is to just pick some numbers from our model prior, right? So basically we, we, we sample from our prior, we plug this in the simulator, we run the simulator, we get some random sample. This, this would be random samples for X. Okay, so randomly generated data with parameters drawn from our priors. So why, why does this help? Well, the, now, now some fun thing happens, which is we can write the two expectation values together, right? So random samples from X times random samples from Z conditioned on X. And you can now use Bayes' theorem to turn this around, right? So it's very hard to sample from the posterior uh, if you have an observation, but it's actually simple to sample an observation once you have the parameters. So we exploit Bayes' theorem as it's written up here, and we end up with something that is actually tractable. So we, the, the process here of generating x, z pairs is um, either is equivalent to first generating z from the prior and then running your simulator and getting a sample from the posterior. So that's very much the same trick that we used when, when I discussed the ABC algorithm, right? We just generate a lot of data parameter pairs with the parameters drawn from the prior. And that's something that is tractable. And we can write it simply as random samples from this joint model, okay? And now suddenly, although the problem became bigger in some sense and, and uh, more, more general, although the generalized model, we suddenly now have a tractable um, average to do here, something that we can do. Okay, questions about this? The pri that's a good question, yeah. So in the context of large, these large forward models, priors can be often just physics informed. So you have actually uh, some reasonable priors from, from other observations, or this is somehow built into the model. Um, and for parameters that you absolutely don't know, you would have to assume priors. Um, and then ideally the results don't depend on those priors. But what priors to choose is also, a, yeah. In, in general, something one has to carefully think about. Um, th this year is more about the procedure of actually getting results once you pick the prior. Um, I can maybe later emphasize a bit more in the examples what kind of priors we took and why. More questions? Okay, so this is now tractable, right? Now still here, the, the we have this intractable part um, which is the posterior density of Z given some observation X, which would be hard to deal with. But we can just continue um, and apply Bayes' theorem, no, and, and split up this, comp no, right. No, the trick is to actually just split up the log uh, into a sum, right, and then we get two terms. One is related to uh, the variational posterior, which we assume we can actually evaluate, okay. We get a minus sign in front, and we have to average here the log of the variational posterior over random draws from this joint model. And the second term here contains the intractable uh, posterior, the intractable target distribution, true posterior. The important thing is now that this intractable posterior, again, doesn't depend actually on the parameters we want to optimize. So we can just, it's a constant as a function of the network parameter, so we can ignore it. And then the target, the loss function, is actually just this first term here. It has this very, very simple form. It's just the average over random draws from our simulation model. Uh, and then we have the average over the log of the, of the um, variational posterior of the, the normalizing flow in many cases. Um, questions? So th there are now, yeah, there's a question. <laughs> 
Um, in, in some sense, we did a similar separation there. Let me go back, didn't we? So, where's the posterior? We have the posterior here. We, here we rep so here we can't pull out the posterior in the same way because the thing that we so the, the we average over something that actually depends on the on the parameters itself. So it's not a constant term. Um, okay. So now we have we end up with two types of algorithms, and I mean this is in some sense very specific. I'm just talking about these two ways of approaching uh, in, uh, inverse problems with KL divergence, but there are a lot of extensions of both of these types of approaches, and so I, I wanted to highlight the main features. So if you talk about variation and inference, we need an explicit likelihood model, right? We need to be able to evaluate the likelihood and even the score. Uh, so, um, whereas for neural ratio estimation or neural posterior estimation, so the thing based on uh, forward KL versions, we need an implicit likelihood model, we need a simulator. Uh, in the first case, we most likely require gradients to use the reparameterization tick in order to to to, uh, mini to uh, do invariation inference. There are ways to do it without, but uh, this is quite efficient. Um, we require specialized architectures in both cases. We require normalizing flows. We can't just uh, uh, like uh, off-the-shelf MLP for this. We get marginal inference in the second case. So in the sense that after we trained our neural posterior estimator. We have the same effect that we had with um, with, with uh, ABC. So we have suddenly tr trained network, and we can throw in any data that we want and immediately get results. For variation inference, that's not necessarily the case, although one can do it like that. Uh, on the other hand, variation and inference. If I go back here, um, if I go back here, so in variation and inference, we always draw the parameters of our training of of our um, training data essentially from the variational posterior. So automatically we start sam running simulations more and more in the more likely regions of the parameter space. So that's a good thing, as we will see a bit later. And there are a few other things that, that I'm not discussing here much. So one is mode seeking, the other would be mass covering. Good, so uh, what I want to highlight here is this marginal inference aspect again, because I think it's, it's quite relevant and I will come back to that. So another way to kind of visualize and, and make the point it's like this where, I mean, just a where is Waldo problem, right? Let's imagine you have an image here, like this here, and you want to find Waldo, and you can solve it either with variational inference or you can solve it with neural posterior estimation. Then if you would want to do variational inference, you, you have to do joint inference. Yeah, I, I showed this in a second. So basically you are forced to do joint inference, which means you first have to get the posterior for all for all the people in the image, right? And all the correlations, Waldo, Lucia, Lucia, Oleg, and so on. So, and then afterwards you have this, this posterior and then you have to integrate. So that, that's a lot of work to get just, just the position of Waldo. Whereas if you use uh, marginal inference techniques, which directly allow you to get to the like, gist of it, to, to the, to the um, posteriors that you, for the parameters you care about, you could just directly train an inference network to tell you something about the position of Waldo, right? So th that's kind of to make the point that can be quite useful. It's the same as the corner plots that I showed before, where we only were interested in one parameter and not the other correlations and parameters, right? And this here would be an application. Um, good. So why why is this relevant? So in, it turns out that if um, right. So in the case of variation and inference, we have this loss function. In the case of neural posterior estimation, we have this loss function. What we could do, for instance, when we do vary, and what we have to do with variation inference uh, is to always sample parameters, right, from the full posterior. We need to sample all the parameters that are input in our likelihood model. There is no way around, and so we need to have a um, variation posterior that is actually uh, that generates as all parameters that are relevant for the model, and this can be highly complex, right? So think about this position of individual people in this image or like any other high dimensional analysis problem, one has here to model high dimensional functions. The problem is, and typically one ends up often to simplify this by using what's called mean field approximation, you just set correlations to zero, but the very nasty aspect of variation and inference is that in that case you don't get actually the correct answer, you get overconfident answers, you get too, too tight constraints on the parameters, so here the exact answer might be this correlated uh, black curve between the two parameters if you use VI and ignore correlations, you end up with this magenta line, uh, so two tight constraints on the two parameters. 
that's that's pretty annoying, um, and it's nothing that and, and neural posterior estimation works quite differently. If you hear, um, just factorize your post. If you hear uh, split up the variation of posterior into factors and neglect correlations, then each of the individual factor factors will turn in a properly norm, uh, marginalized um, marginalized posterior. So you would, if you use neural posterior estimation, get here the correct answer for this complicated integral without ha ever having done it explicitly. So that's, that's a pretty nice thing, um, because you can then focus your attention on the parameters you care about and not deal with, with all the rest. Okay, so are there questions about this so far? So no, now I want to introduce our version of it. This is basically summarizing what I was just discussing. So the silence means either you are bored or it's way too much. What do you require that you don't need at you know, doing var variational inference? So you are wondering if no posterior estimation is simple, why do people do variational inference? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. What's the point of doing variational inference if normal posterior estimation is available? What, uh, what do you need? I mean, right, right now it's just a also open research field in some sense, so various approaches are exploited. Variational inference is something that is very powerful if you have actually gradients. Like, I mean, th that's the basis for variational autoencoders. And it has been quite a bit used um, yeah, in that context, in the context of um, analyzing, astro let's say, astrophysical data, what's appealing with variation inference is, for instance, that it can very efficiently exploit gradient information. So uh, a very popular trend for various reasons in our research field is to take a likelihood-based model, a any like, yeah, likelihood-based model, uh, explicit model, and write it in terms of uh, auto-differentiable pro pro um, programming language using JAX or TORCH or, or uh, Julia Zygote or something, and this enables you then to get gradients, uh, get the score, and the score is then input for something like variation inference, or it would be input for in, in Hamiltonian Monte Carlos, for instance. So th it's it's quite, th yeah, it, it's just ongoing research basically to explore what works here well and what not, and I'm kind of summarizing here what works well. I think one of the appealing features is also that you get targeted inference automatically. So you automatically zoom into the relevant parameter space and simulate more there. In practice, my experience with this is that it still requires a very large number of simulations before it converges. And one of the main drawbacks is that you often that you have to do joint inference and you often end up being forced because of the complexity of the problem to neglect some of the correlations, which then gives you overconfident results. So I was more interested, like, uh, what are the drawbacks of neural posterior estimation? Okay, the drawbacks of <laughs> neural posterior estimation here is um, you don't automatically get targeted inference, so you draw initially from the full prior, and I will address this, so there's something, some extension called sequential neural posterior estimation, which addresses this to some extent. Um, some people would say the drawback is you can't exploit gradient information. So it's, it's still unclear also for me under what circumstances is it better to have a score-based model and under what circumstances is it better to have a simulation-based model. And right, another drawback here would be that, um, yeah, actually is that you need to implicit likelihood model. So traditionally in physics uh, and also in astrophysical settings, we typically have likelihood-based models because this is what people used to do. So in some cases where one wants to analyze data, like from the cosmic microwave problem, there is simply no simulator that one would trust. And it's very hard to write these simulators uh, sometimes. So there are reasons to do one or the other. Um, I, I'm, so my own history is I started with this year very enthusiastically four years ago, and, at some, and then we moved over to, to this year slowly. And I tried to kind of explain what what were the reasons in the process? Thank you. Yeah. Can you comment a bit on the amortization aspect of the technique? Because I see in the brackets the amortization for the variational inference. Yeah, it's maybe. Okay, so here it's automatically amortized in a similar way to ABC. For variation inference, a variation autoencoder is 
amortized in some sense, right? So you could do the same trick here. Instead of having just uh, one piece of training data, you use a large number of images and, and train it on that. So in that sense, it would be urban. In practice, uh, the examples that I've seen used in the literature are not amortized in this context. Okay, so let me, okay, there were, yeah, one more question. Uh, I am a little confused on what Z and phi are in this case because you said Z were the parameters of your problem and phi are the parameters of your neural network. That, that's a very good question because apparently you didn't define this. So if there are more questions like that, please don't hesitate. So phi is here. So Q is my, um, let's say, normalizing flow. Okay, phi are all the network parameters, so biases and weights. And Z would be the parameters, the physical parameters of my simulation model. So these are the parameters that tell me where individual stars are or pulsars are or how much cosmic rays are generated or what's the mass of two masses of merging black holes. So these are physical parameters of my simulation model, of my likelihood model, which I defined. I mean, the, the, the examples came from, I showed various examples in the first part of the lecture uh, for three uh, or four examples. So for an, yeah. So in the case, I, I will come to more examples. This, so this might become okay right because in some fields, what they are doing is that they're just saying that we don't need this Z at all, and we only use a Q phi or just a neural network to approximate everything. You know, like it, there's no need for any physical parameters. But I, I think the case is different here. Yeah, so the situation is here that we actually are interested in measuring the physical parameters, right? So the goal is not to have a neural net that happens to replace physics, but uh, a neural net that t simply tells us which of our models are correct and what are the correct parameters. Yeah. So yeah, I think in that sense, it's quite different from many other machine learning applications where you actually need to, in the first place, come up with a good model for data. In our field, typically, you hope that you actually have like a physical model for your data that you then can just fit to data and, and uh, you want to use data to learn something about that model. Um, good, so now let me get to uh, TMNRE. So I, I will just talk through this in some detail. So it's based on implicit likelihood models. Um, it allows marginal inference. There's a way to do targeted inference. Um, and yeah, we, we will just slowly walk through this, right? And one feature is here also that we don't need specialized network architectures. As I mentioned, we need normalizing flows or something that normalizes, that keeps uh, probability densities normalized to one for using variation inference or neural posterior estimation. No, uh, using normalizing flows is perfectly fine and possible, but it's even nicer to have a setting where you can just use a random MLP and you still get good results. So and that's what I will start with. So the approach that I, uh, we'll discuss now is based on neural ratio estimation, which is a way to do neural posterior estimation with MIP, essentially. Marginal inference, so we want to focus on being able to measure individual parameters and like forget about the rest. And then also sequential inference, which allows us to, to have to use training data that looks like the real data, so that uh, it's very close to real data, so that we get very precise answers. Good, so first, neural ratio estimation, it's very simple in some sense. So we now try to estimate this ratio. We don't try to estimate a posterior or a likelihood, but we tr which are normalized to one, but we try to estimate this ratio between the likelihood function and the evidence, or the posterior and the prior, or the joint model and the marginal model. Again, x are simulation, uh, simulated data, and z are the parameters of my physical model. And the nice thing of estimating these ratios is that they are not normalized to one, in some sense. So we don't, we can actually approximate them with anything that is non-negative. So we can just use MLP exponentiated, and that's a good model for this ratio. Okay. And in order to train this ratio, we just have to solve essentially a simple binary classification task. So assume that um, we have parameter pairs, parameter data pairs, um, and we can either have matching parameter data pairs or scrambled parameter data pairs. So I visualize this here in this odd way. So imagine we have images of cats and dogs and houses and stars. And the para so this would be X. And then Z, in this case here, would be uh, discrete labels. So this would be, Z might be just a cat label or monkey label and so on. So and then our simulation model would be, we would first generate a random uh, tag, a random label, and then we would have a simulator that simulates an image with that tag. Okay, so that's the setting. 
the end the simulator will be a physics simulator and the label will be some parameters. So we can have matching pairs and then we can take uh, those simulated data and just randomly now scramble labels and data. So we end up with a cat image with a dog label and so on. And now, that, as, now we have two classes, right? So we have matching classes and non-matching classes. Sometimes these non-matching classes might match by accident because um, that can happen, but usually they won't. And now we task a neural network to look at X and Z simultaneously and tell us, okay, was this drawn from class one or class zero, right? That's the simplest possible thing you can do. It's just a binary classification task. So we boiled this very complicated problem of posterior estimation of, of Bayesian inference down to simple binary classification task. And this isn't, I mean, it's nothing we invented. It's going back to just density ratio estimation. And in context of Bayesian inference, this popped up in just four years ago the first time. Okay, if you now set this up, I'm going through this in some detail. It's like we have two classes, the joint draws and the marginal draws, okay? And we need priors for, and let's assume half of the data is joint. The other half of the training data is scrambled, so we bo both classes have equal probability. And we can decide this because we can just simulate how we want, right? So we can run a lot of, typically we would run a lot of simulations that are joined, and then afterwards we would just scr scramble them, and then we end up with the same amount of scrambled data. And now the next step is simply to train a binary classifier, right? With a binary cross-entropy loss function, very, very simple stuff. And if you do this, one can show that the network should approximate in the end this uh, optimization, uh, yeah, th this specific ratio, joint divided by joint plus marginal densities. And th if you divide now by the marginal densities, you see the ratio appearing, right? So you, if you divide by the, by the marginal densities, you get P of X comma Z divided by P of X times P of Z. So we end up with this ratio here. And that's all there is, right? So I, um, the trick would be generating training data, from our simulation model, we draw parameters from the prior, run the simulator, get X, we get training samples. We initialize a real valued neural network. Um, and then we train the neural network using binary cross entropy loss uh, with these two classes uh, using mini batches. And then if after training, if you don't overfit, if you do everything in the proper way, we end up with F turning into the log of the ratio that we were interested in. And, and that's it, right? And then we suddenly have this ratio. We just exponentiate it, and we can use it to plot posteriors and, and so on and so forth. So in some sense, and, and you can see that this here works even if you don't have any smart network that is always normalized to one. It's just a classification network. And if everything goes right, it will kind of automatically normalize itself to one, uh, approximately. Um, good. Network architecture, so network architecture might look like this. So, sorry, this here would be Z, right? Our model parameters, um, physical model parameters. And then typically what, what we need is a network architecture that takes in as input Z and X, right? So we have here some, let's say, image X and some parameter vector Z. Here it's called phi, sorry for that. And they would go into this network and we won't have a single output F which turns into this ratio. And typically inside the network, we would have an embedding, maybe a, a convolutional neural net or some version of a UNAT or whatnot that compresses the image here, let's say in a few data summaries, then we would just concatenate the data summaries with the parameters we care about, plug this in the MLP, and the MLP spits out a single number, and this number will turn into this ratio if you train the network. In the process, also, this embedding here will actually learn optimal data summary in the sense that um, the posterior becomes very narrow. It tries to be maximally different from the prior. One can go into the math of this. What you see here, actually, is also that instead of having a single MLP, I stacked here three MLPs. So one can take the parameter vector and pick out different combinations. So here, this is the first parameter, the second parameter, and then the third and fourth. And each of these MLPs would then learn a different ratio. So one would you learn the posterior in some sense for the first parameter, another would learn the marginal posterior for the second parameter, and another would learn the marginal posterior for the third and fourth parameter. The first two would be 1D, this, the, the last one would be 2D. So this here turns out to be very flexible and, and efficient because you can like efficiently cal 
evaluate MLPs, reasonably small MLPs in parallel, and, and get them uh, a lot of posteriors estimated that way. Uh, okay, questions about this? Yeah. Um, regarding the presentations of the picture, for example, so this uh, S1 to S4 here, um, so if it's really, like really still high dimensional because you need like high dimensional features to um, yeah, have it appropriate, um, doesn't them um, get the uh, influence of your parameters lost? For example, your theta one is just one dimensional and your S is like thousand dimensional. Um, yeah. Is this not a problem? This, yeah, so how to act actually exactly set this up is very context dependent. So usually you should have at least one summary per parameter. So if you want to estimate four here, there should be also four summaries. Um, if you have too many summaries, then the MLP has too much to do in some sense. So yeah, it's a good idea if the number of summaries is kind of comparable to the number of parameters you want to estimate. Also, sometimes it's useful to have sing individual summaries for different, um, for different parameters and, and so on. So th that's just one simple example. In principle, one can play around with this quite a bit. What is, what is the reason of making um, the first two one-dimensional and the third two-dimensional? It's, it's just an example to, to show that instead of here estimating, let's say, directly the full joint posterior, we can actually, in some sense, cherry-pick what parameters we want to estimate. So here we, est we decided we wanted to just get the marginal posterior for the first, the marginal posterior for the second, and for some reason we are, might be interested in the correlation between the third and fourth. So we plug them in there. And okay. this, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, so sorry for the very low level uh, technical question, but c could you tell something more about uh, uh, this architecture of embedding uh, parts? So, for example, uh, so my question really boils down to the, uh, uh, to the like, do you have a single CNN which. Uh, uh, is not uh, sometimes maybe not able to capture the whole context, or do you, for example, uh, embed uh, certain patches of the image? Mm. How does it work? It yeah. So in practice, I mean, this here is kind of very schematic. So what the embedding looks like will depend very much on how the data looks like. So for images, this sometimes would be CNNs. Um, for it, but there can be also just galaxy lists. Then maybe a graph neural network is a good idea. Sometimes we j they have actually Fourier transforms and then a bunch of linear layers that compress efficiently uh, gravitational wave data. And so this here is ex extremely context dependent and one has to, to make a choice. So the, the generic thing is kind of the embedding gives you summaries which then go into MLP. This always remains the same. But the way we get to the summaries will depend a lot of context. Also you could imagine, so sometimes our embeddings are units which then spit out basically as many summaries as you have pixels of the image which are then correlated with individual parts and then you can turn this into a point source detector for instance. Um, so in that case you would have as many marginal posteriors as, as you have pixels in the image. I, I will show examples for this. Um, yeah? Wait, uh, yeah? Go ahead. Um, I'm a bit confused about the relationship of binary classification to the task. Maybe you could explain it a little bit more. Or, and could we also see binary classification here in this architecture? Uh, so the, the binary classification comes in because I need a network that takes as input XZ pairs and that gives me, a, um, a, yeah, that, that turns and estimates the probability that they were jo uh, jointly drawn so that they match or that they were marginally drawn. So for, uh, let's say gravitational wave signals, so the, you have a simulated piece of signal X and then, then Z might be the mass of one of the initial black holes that joined. Then you want to know, okay, you want to train a network that tells you, okay, does this piece of data actually uh, fit well, correspond with, with, a, with a mass that I plugged into the network or not? So in that sense, the network is a bit odd because it takes in, for instance, an image or a graph or a time series data plus some numbers. And this has to be some somehow concatenated at some level. And so typically we would first do an embedding and then concatenate and then the output would be the classification answer basically. So yes, no. And it just happen, so happens that this corresponds to this ratio that we care about in Bayesian inference. Okay, let, let me maybe get to, through a few more examples because then maybe it becomes a bit clear. So first I want to visualize here the training just because it's fun. So imagine 
We have a very, very trivial model with embedding that is just a linear layer and a single parameter, that, which is shown here. And this is the data summary that the embedding generates. Initially, it's like completely uninformative, right? But if you then just train the network, you see that it picks up the correlation with the parameters. The blue points are the scrambled data. They remain uncorrelated. The red points are the, the marginal data. And the color in the background shows what the MLP estimates. So it basically just solves the problem of how are there more, is a point in a specific region, is it blue or red? Right, so very, very simple stuff. And then if you, if you do that, it turns out that afterwards you have a, a, a like amortized inference network. If you then say, okay, I measured something, some X, and the data summary to that is F, uh, no, sorry, I called it here F. So the summary is S equals minus 0.5, you just read this graph up along this axis and you get the posteriors. And this example is set up such by hand that actually it's bimodal posterior because I end the parameter here goes from minus one to one and I, I end up, it enters in the model quadratically. So that, that's, that's how this would look like in practice, right? So there's this part that learns optimal data summaries and this kind of tries to make the difference between the blue points, the scramble points, and the joint point, or the joint, jointly drawn points maximally large, so it kind of rips them apart to some extent. And then there's this other part, the MLP, which estimates just the, the point density. Okay, I, this is the only video I made of that, but it's like showing how the network trains. Uh, good, let me go to some more aspects of this. So one thing that I mentioned early on was uh, this kind of targeted inference versus non-targeted inference. Let's suppose we have, a we have an observation that looks like this, of some strong lensing image, right? And now we train an inference network to tell us, let's say, the, the radius of this ring here, okay? If we draw simulation data from the full prior range of our many model parameters, 15 or so model parameters, the training data will look like this, okay? If I now train a network, a CN so a ratio estimator using a CNN, to estimate the radius, I get get a posterior, which is not technically wrong, but will be, which will be very wide. It will be dominated by basically the finite number of training samples that I had and network capacity. And you see here this blue line, that this is kind of just the illustration, but you see the blue line, a very wide posterior, okay? If I instead actually start, would start from a much more constrained range of parameter spaces, which are already very close to the target observation, same number of, um, same network architecture, same number of training examples, but much more focused on what I care about, the posterior becomes much more narrow. And if I keep doing this, then at some point the posterior will not be dominated anymore more by network per capacity or by the finiteness of my training examples, but just about op by the statistical noise of my measurement, by the image noise. That, that's kind of the goal of this. So you see that actually targeting training data is quite important in, get a, in order to get the most precise answers. Of course, this is nothing you can do with real-world data that you don't simulate yourself, right? But since we are able to run the simulators as we want, we can do that and we can get as precise answers as we want. I mean, as, as the data allows. Now, this is an entire research field, again, called sequential neural posterior estimation, sequential neural ratio estimation, sequential neural likelihood estimation. There are all variants, variations of this. Um, in the, right, I'm not going to talk much about this. I'm just showing you how we do, do this. So basically, um, what we suggested is a specific way of doing it, which works well for our use cases, well for the situation where we want to be able to estimate all kinds of marginal parameters, marginal posteriors individually. So the way we do this is we run the analysis in multiple rounds. Okay, so initially we would draw, so this is Z1, Z2, uh, let's say two model parameters we care about. Initially, we would draw them from the entire prior range, okay? So here it's mi plus minus five, and uniform priors over this range, and you see the black dots. They correspond to random samples from our prior. For those parameters, we would run a simulator, uh, which gives us X, then we would train a posterior a ratio estimator, and then we use the following trick. So let's say we trained a ratio estimator, okay? like this here, this is our estimated ratio. Uh, so it's likelihood divided by uh, model evidence. And then we say, okay, everything that is smaller than a certain tiny number, maybe 10 to minus six, is out. So this, uh, th those parameter ranges have so low likelihood that they will not be relevant for my model. So in this case, I can define a 
target region here, a subset of my full initial parameter space, gamma. And then as a next step, I sample now training data only in the smaller target region, still from the prior. You can see this up here. So my new proposal distribution is still the prior. But I multiply this here with this indicator function, which basically throws out everything that is outside my uh, outside of the region that, that my initial first round neural ratio estimator told me uh, has a high likelihood. Um, and so you end up with training data in the smaller region. It's still drawn from the prior, but uh, we truncated the prior in a specific way with a hard likelihood constraint. And now we can use this training data to train a new neural ratio estimator, which now gi will give a slightly tighter answer. So it will learn already the posterior better. And then we can use this better trained second round neural ratio estimator to again truncate the likelihood uh, posterior. We get new training data in the smaller region, and we repeat, we get new training data in the smaller region. And at some point, the algorithm converges, because at some point, we are hitting the point where the width of the posterior here is dominated by intrinsic measurement noise, um, or maybe other noise, but measurement noise typically of our analysis problem. And this is where, where the entire thing doesn't shrink anymore. Okay? And the advantage here is that we are continuously drawing from the prior, not from anything else, which means that we don't bias our results in any way if everything goes well. So afterwards, we can still use the training data drawn from this tiny region here to estimate all the parameters that we want. Okay, this is different from the techniques I haven't talked about that are traditionally used in sequential inference where one would draw from approximations to the posterior and not from truncated priors. This introduces problem problems. Um, questions about that? I, I think, ah, right, I have this here visualized nicely. So imagine now we have our strong lensing image analysis problem. We have this ring here that we want to, to simulate, uh, to, to fit. So in the first round, training data would look maybe like this. And the second round, training data would start looking like this. So it's already like picking up the Einstein ring, uh, so the, the radius of the, of the, of the um, lensed image. And it still varies a lot, and one could here make a lot of plots in between, they will increasingly lead to something that looks like this here. So an image, simulated image, which will be very close to what we observe and which gives then tight posteriors, okay? Tight, basically tight measurements of the parameters. Um, questions about that? I think you were first. I probably missed it, but how do you train your model? So you have this f, which is the output of your model, right? And you know this logarithm on your ratio, mm -hmm. and then you have this correspondence between probabilities and f, probabilities of having this label y. So what is the objective here? So maybe I can go back to um, this slide here. So the, the entire procedure is shown here. So initially, we have a prior, right? So this would correspond to this in the example that I just showed to this white box, uh, to this larger box from minus six to six with two parameters, then we would plug those, we would dry, draw from the prior, we plug this into our simulator model and we get some simulated data. And then we repeat this n times and we get these pairs of simulation data and matching parameters that correspond. So it's basically like just having labeled training data, that's it, okay? And then we initialize, uh, and then our goal is to uh, distinguish these random draws here from our simulation model from scrambled random draws where we basically pair up parameters and simulation results randomly. So technically how we would do this is we just take this list and randomize the ordering of Z. And then you end up with random draws that look like this here. And then we simply train a binary classifier that must, has to take as input X and Z, right? Because that's, that's like where the, yeah, how, how the samples are defined. So we train a binary classifier to tell us whether something was drawn from our simulator or whether something uh, was drawn from the scrambled simulations. And then what will happen, and you can, and this here is the binary cross entropy loss function. You could use different loss functions for the same task, but you, this does the trick already. So you would have here the network as input, the sigmoid function, and the log of it, uh, l yeah, the log of it, uh, for the matching pairs. And here, the same expression, except that you have a minus sign in front of f for the randomized pairs. And what this does is, if, if you minimize it, the f tries to become large for matching pairs, and it tries to become small for randomized pairs. 
okay? Because you have a minus sign here and you have a minus sign here and you want to minimize the loss. So in some sense, F yeah, tries, to, yeah, tries to be large, right? And sigma, sigma at F tries to be close to one if you plug in something that matches and otherwise sigma at minus, uh, sigma at minus uh, yeah. Sigma at F tries to be small if you plug in something that doesn't match. And if you calculate actually analytically, and you can do this like, yeah, just using uh, some calculus, uh, you find that the thing that minimizes this loss function is a network that approximates exactly this ratio. One can show this, for instance, by simply turning this sum here into a proper integral and then using uh, functional derivatives, you end up with this, this here. Then in practice, the network will not exactly approximate this here. I mean, it will approximate it. It will not be exactly equal to this expression, but if you do everything properly, enough training data, you stop when the validation loss like uh, starts increasing again, you get a pretty good approximation to this ratio. So the idea is to have high ratio for matching pairs? Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. And you can see this here, right? So if you have a high number of format, so here this is the ratio. Uh, it can only be something, so if the ratio is large, you would have matching pairs. If the ratio is small, you would have, or smaller than one, you would have um, uh, marginal pairs. And then the log just turns and stretches this into something from minus to plus infinity so that you can use a MLP that to, to predict this expression. I don't know who was first. Can I speak louder or, or just pull up my I, um, yeah, I can also repeat. Um, I have two questions. Uh, how does these methods handle uh, multimodality in what you call the parameter zeta? I mean, there are probably multiple causes from, for, for the same observation. The, the parameter z, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah that's uh, quite interesting. So, so for instance, in the example that I showed here, no, I, let, let me actually go to the example that I had in the end. So it actually works pretty well. Um, so th this here is an example, which we actually put in the paper where we put, so the paper ended up in NeurIPS. It's, it's about TMNRE, and as an example, we used something with a very like million modes, basically. So imagine you have a, a, a 10 dimensional parameter space, and in each direction you have two modes, okay, two peaks. Then you end up with a lot of modes if you go to 10D. Or no, I think this is 20D, actually. Right, and so if you wanted to explore this with MCMC, this wouldn't work, obviously. Um, if you do neural posterior estimation, let's say, and try to reconstruct all the peaks, actually works much better than I thought, but still not brilliantly. Um, but what we did here was to just look at marginals. So if you look at 1D or 2D marginals, they always just have two peaks or four peaks, right? And you can pretty well reconstruct those modes without actually dealing with all the other modes. And the reason is in some sense that the network just keeps ignoring the data that is related to these other modes. So we, we can talk more about this, it's an interesting question. There are ways, in situations where this would fail, there are, but there are also situations where it works pretty well. And, and the second question, if I can, is um, how fast can this run? Uh, I, um, I'm interested because I, I do robotics and for, for us, like try to do things that work in real time is... So, so this you, yeah, so usually, may, maybe I can comment on this while I show examples, and um, because it's very example dependent in the end. Um, yeah, we have more questions here. Yeah, uh, I, one more and then I go through the rest and then maybe we can have a Q&A. Yep. So in this slide with differences yeah. uh, of, those, uh, of those methods, you mentioned failure mode. And could you elaborate a bit more on that? I mentioned what? Sorry, I didn't get uh, it. The bottom, call, the bottom uh, row yeah. uh, where you mentioned, I think, failure modes. Ah, okay, so the failure modes, uh, okay. I'd, I'd really like to hear more about this. Um, so maybe we can, yeah, let, let's do this now. I think I have a, okay, so the traditional thing is the, this here, so you will have seen this, pro maybe you have seen this, so if you have, Variational inference is based on uh, reverse KL divergence. Neural posterior estimation is based on forward KL divergence, and those pro the, yeah there are different failure modes if your uh, fitting function is under complex. So let's suppose you have two peaks in the posterior, and you model it just with one Gaussian. Then in the case of variational inference, you would typically end up with the Gaussian just picking up one peak and forgetting about the other one, and this is called mode seeking. Whereas in neural posterior estimation, the thing would try to stretch. 
And, and it has to do with the structure of this log ratio, so what can be zero or what not without getting divergencies. In the case of neural ratio estimation, it behaves more like this and even a bit more extreme for some reason. So it's neither mask covering nor mode seeking. I sometimes called it tail covering or tail seeking because it really tries to get the tails right, which is, is, is useful. Yeah. Um, I, I was just wondering, maybe it's related to um, the question that about the modes that we just discussed. Yeah. But I remember that you uh, talked about the needle in a haystack problem a yeah. bit earlier. And if you do this uh, truncation of the prior, um, when you sample, uh, could it become a problem that you are like actually missing something if it's so hard to like find the right parameter combinations? Um, that's a good question. It depends on the context. So the specific needle in the haystack problems have the pro that I'm aware of have the property that although there are tons of peaks in the likelihood function, um, all but one are basically um, integrate to almost zero probability. So the, your MCMC chain would get stuck there because it's very hard to calculate, yeah, to avoid. But if you use simulation-based inference, those modes wouldn't even appear necessarily in your estimate because they are extraordinarily unlikely to be relevant. Um, but the, I, I can have also, I, yeah, maybe we can do this in the coffee break. So there are, it's really context dependent under what circumstances you can have problems. For instance, so w what's nice with simulation-based inference is that oft I mean the mode typically corresponds, it's, it's something that is very localized if you think about likelihoods, right? It's just a peak somewhere, and if you miss the peak, you're kind of screwed, then you don't know what is high likelihood. But if you think th about this from the perspective of simulation, typically it means the summary statistic is crossing the value that you care about, right? So I, I mean, I showed this, if, if you think, think about the plots that I had earlier. Um, let me show you. Yeah, any plot goes, basically. I mean, this year, right? So if, if you just look at the final output of this year, how does this now start? So, right, so it just means your summary at some point crosses these mo This year, basically, is the data, and the data crosses here uh, the observation. No, sorry, the, the, um, so the observation is here, and the summary crosses the observation, and this corresponds to the peaks. So in some sense, the network has a ha much easier job to figure out that the true values are here because it kind of can extra extrapolate from here and here into this region. So that, that's why it often works. Then there can be situations where the observation is up here, right? And where this year looks more like poc, like this year and just touches your observation. Then if you don't have much training data here in this peak region, you miss the mode. Uh, maybe uh, it's easier to explain than I thought. Okay, so this is maybe the, the main failure mode. And, and this can happen in the context of particle physics and so on. So it's, it's a concern. Let me maybe get through some of the examples because we actually use this also for stuff. Um, so gravitational wave parameter inference. Um, so here, remember, we had this time series data, right? Um, so nice waveform. And so the full model might have 15 parameters. The way we, and the traditional way to analyze it would be to maybe tr run a 15 dimension MCMC, or less traditional way, modern way, would be to train normalizing flow NPE in 15D. The way we approach this problem here is to basically train 15 1D posterior estimators, right, for all parameters. And then in the end, we get 15 1D posteriors, and we can use those to kind of cut out parts of the parameter space that don't fit the data. So we do like simulate, ratio estimate, inference, and then truncate, and then re-simulate, and, and run here in a circle. And if we do this a bunch of times, we actually get, um, right, and, and then we feed back the information into the simulator and, and truncate. Um, yeah, this is what I showed before. Good, so if you, th and the truncation scheme here works like this, so we have an estimator for each of the parameters, and then the constraint prior is basically the real prior times 15 indicator functions that cut away the parameters in various directions. And what this looks like in practice is like here initially the training data wiggles around, right? So the, you see here the, um, in ma magenta training data, the truth is this red thing. And then as the rounds progress, um, the the algorithm picks up more and more parameters. Initially, it picked just up the time of coalescence where the black holes merge, black, so black holes merge, and so on. 
and the posteriors here in the, in the subsequent rounds become sharper and sharper. You can see this here for, for some of the parameters. It, it sounds like a tedious process because we train basically each round 15 networks and then we do this like 10 times. So we train like 150 networks. But training MLPs is not that slow, so that's pretty fast. Uh, and the entire algorithm runs quite quickly. Um, what, what I first want to point out is although we here focused just on 1D posteriors, right? Everything is built such that subsequently, if you are done at the end, we can still train now here quite a large number of 2D posterior estimators for all to study all the correlations, okay? And we get back the results that you would get if you would have run an MCMC chain or, or nested sampling, except that even although we train all these networks and run all these simulations, we need 100 times less simulations than what you, what you would have needed to run the one MCMC in 15D. So it's quite efficient. Um, although it requires a lot of network training. Um, right, so runtime is here. This here is dominated by the, r the simulator cost. So typically, the entire analysis takes still a day. So it's not well, half a day. It's still, fast, still f much faster than the, nested, uh, the, than the MCMC part or nested sampling part, uh, which took a couple of days. But the network training time is typically subdominant, but it's still of the orders of hours in total. So with the resources that, that we used. So it's, it's nothing for, like inst for getting instantaneous results. You can also train networks that are amortized over the entire parameter space that don't do the sequential thing. They give you instantaneously answers. But training these networks becomes more and more difficult if you go like, to larger problems. For instance, right now we are finishing a paper where we analyze two gravitational waveforms. The thing that took six months with MCMC, for us it takes also a day or two. So and, and it actually is testable and, and, and works. It's nice. Um, strong lensing image analysis. So here, that's a our target image. Um, here, the logic was slightly different. So here, we first have an analysis that just focuses on the 14 or 15 parameters that describe the lens as a whole. So the background galaxy, the foreground galaxy, the mass of the foreground galaxy, and so on. And um, then feed this back into our lensing simulator. And then as a second step, we look for tiny, tiny subhalos here. So, um, which sit, so there's a subhalo sitting up here. And then we end up with two sets of high dimensional posteriors. So one set of 15 dimensional posteriors for the, for the main parameters of the lens, and then three, a three dimensional posterior for the subhalo. And um, the reason why this is relevant is for instance, that if we, so untruncated simulation data would look like this. If you would do the truncation scheme in the same way as I did for gravitational waves before, training data would still look like this here, so not very constrained. The reason, oh, I don't have a good plot for this, the reason is that the parameters are very correlated. So if you don't take into account parameter correlations, you end up still with having a lot of parameter space in your simulations that doesn't fit the data well. But if you actually model correlations correctly, so by actually fitting, I think, a 14-dimensional joint posterior, yeah, not 15, um, you end up with pretty tight training data, and now you can train another network to look at this little subhalo and uh, analyze it, and it works. So here, this is actually a detection of the position of the subhalo and of the mass of the subhalo in this lensing image. This is the first time actually the simulation-based approaches have been successfully used to detect subhalos, like here. This image is very old, and it has been detected many times using likelihood-based techniques, but with simulation-based techniques, one has to really be careful with zooming in correctly into the parameter space, uh, which kind of is automatic in MCMC. Okay, so this here works nicely. Um, and right, I try to visualize here with these... Sorry for jumping back and forth, it's horrible. So I try to visualize here with these plots actually the way we truncate. So here we truncate these 15 parameters individually, you see this? And we, we neglect all the correlations. Um, although we afterwards can still recover them. Boop, boop. Whereas here for the strong lensing image, we first train the main parameters or the macro parameters, including all their correlations. And once we truncated them well, we can look for the subhalo and also in, uh, in, in, uh, look for, for correlations between parameters. So there's some flexibility in the scheme. Um, yet another example. That's the last one. Um, it's a bit tricky. Maybe I go as fast. So, so um, another example is just analyzing point sources. 
So this here would be, uh, g let's say, a gamma ray image. Just very simple in principle, just a bunch of sources. Some are bright, some are less bright. They are predicted here by a, Bayesian by a hierarchical model where we have some population parameters and then some predictions for the number of sources and then we have individual source parameters. And then the source, par the source parameters determine how the image looks like. Analyzing these kind of images turns out to be really difficult in practice because, uh, because it's a difficult statistical problem. There are some sources that you can clearly detect and then there are a lot of sources that are below the detection threshold that are very dim that you might detect or not, or that might be one or two sources. So doing a proper exploration of the parameter space here is extraordinarily difficult, also because the mob problem is what's called transdimensional. So you, have, you don't even know how many model parameters you have because you don't know how many sources there are. So the way we tackled this, um, I can't go into details, but I'll just give you a very brief idea. It sounds a bit crazy, but it works. So we train four neural networks. One detects the sources, that's a unit. Then another one uh, detects, uh, estimates how well the first network works. So it learns how, how good your detection network works and what's the source detection threshold above you can see sources. And then we feed this information back into the simulator. So now the simulator can simulate detected sources and undetected sources. It can basically make a catalog of sources you would have detected. And then we can train uh, two more networks that tell us something about the population parameters, so about the extent of the, the distribution of sources, um, both based on detected sources and undetected sources. And if you put this all together, so, so what, what happens here is that if you look at the target observation with a few bright sources, initially they are all over the place, but after round two, the bright sources will be fixed where they should be, whereas the others still vary. And if you do this, we can get consistent results on um, on the population parameters, and so on and so forth. I'm rushing a bit because I want to still give you some chance to ask questions at the end. So one can also, we started using this for image analysis. So you can have like, if you want to fit this image with the Gaussian random field, initially the training data looks like this, and then it kind of picks up the image. That's nice because with relatively little training data, you can actually get reasonable posterior samples from, from, uh, from the posterior for such images. And right, so the, the reason why we developed this or the entire like, goal with this is uh, what I call here inference assembly. And I try to like, highlight a few examples now. So this, this idea that you can take a difficult to analyze problem, break it into parts, into these individual networks, analyze separately those parts, maybe with a unit, maybe with object counting network, maybe with a graph neural net, and then get still consistent results at the end, get still marginal posteriors that all in principle are consistent because they are all in principle derived from the same underlying joint. So that's the idea of, of uh, efference assembly. When I talk about this, I usually get questions like, why don't you just use blah? And because maybe that solves your problem. And this tool is often probabilistic programming languages like Stan, Pyro, Edward, who, who knows about these languages? So some of you. Um, the, the interesting aspect is that usually these tools focus their intention and the, the authors on estimating the joint, which is great if you can do it, right? But in practice, often the joint is simply in, intractable because the problem is too large. And so what we want to get at is like consistent approaches to look at a large number of marginal posteriors, whatever you care about in terms of like, and so it's up to you to select the marginal posteriors, but the goal is to have something that allows you to get consistent results. And right, so we wrote a software library that tries to implement this, started with this idea, hey, let's write a software library, and took more than three years, and we're still working on it. Uh, it's <laughs> it turns out that it's far from obvious how the API for something like this should look like, because splitting up problems, training tons of networks in parallel, and combining everything at the end is nothing that the typical libraries do right now. Um, so there's some history behind this uh, learning process for us. Um, and the goal is, yeah, as I said, this process of inference assembly so that we don't have to split the problem into parts and then maybe make simplified models but and, and have a ha hard time afterwards of co combining results in a coherent way, but instead we try to split the problem into parts, train maybe various networks to look at parts of the posterior, marginal posteriors, 
in a way that still allows us afterwards to, to combine everything in a coherent way. Um, I'm rushing through this bit, but I want to get... So there are lots of open questions, research questions, especially related to how to do this in ultra high dimensional models, things related to the typical set, for instance. Um, but let me come to the conclusion. So large forward models are omnipresent in physics and astronomy and pose challenges for analyzing current and future data. Uh, it's very obvious that deep learning opens many new powerful ways of tackling these inference challenges and problems. Um, it's quite an active research field. There are a large variety of different methods and algorithms, both simulation-based, likelihood-based, they differ in the applicability scaling and requirements for forward models. Uh, with this algorithm TMNRE or the software pack package SWIFT, we try to do our best to, to like address these challenges and provide a framework for analyzing large forward models in, in this kind of inference, uh, inference assembly type of way. And as I said, there are many open questions, so if you're interested in thinking more about this, talk to me. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thanks. I know you're using MLPs for most of the tasks, but um, how dependent are these on network architectures? Have you had a chance to explore other architectures as well in detail? So, yeah, so for, for the last step of combining parameters, um, a actually I should say we don't use pure MLP, but it's a little ResNet. Um, but it turn turns out that it doesn't depend much on that, so it's, it's relatively simple. Let's say four layers, 128 nodes or something. Uh, um, yeah, so, so there, this doesn't matter. What matters a lot is this embedding network, and that can be sometimes quite a headache. So we used in the past, what did we use? We used mixer MLPs, graph neural nets, CNNs, UNETs, just some, sometimes linear layers, uh, sometimes MLPs, so it's very context-dependent. And sometimes my students come up with weird stuff that I don't know, that which works, but I don't know if it has a name. And so, yeah, but, but what, what's very important, and I didn't discuss this much, is often to ground this again in, in some sense of statistical reality. So the, the interesting thing is you typically don't get wrong results. So it it's rarely happens that the network completely gives you wrong answers because just, I mean, then you typically overfit. But what can easily happen is that you get too weak constraints so that it, it, you get just wider posteriors than the ones that you should have gotten if you would have done everything correctly. Uh, and detecting these cases and addressing them can be difficult. So the way we do this typically is to look at, again, simpler versions of the problem, think about like Fisher forecasting or running a little MCMC on a subset of the problem and seeing that in that case, actually, our results agree uh, so that you can be sure that it's not too far off from reality. Um, could you please elaborate on the intuition behind truncating the prior in multiple rounds versus a single round? Um, okay, so the, the reason why we do this is because only if you do this in, sub, in multiple rounds, actually, we get enough constraints on the prior in order to, to really zoom in and focus on the parameter region of interest. So uh, basic, you can think about this basically as training a neural ratio estimator that helps you to more or less firmly exclude part of the parameter space. And initially you would exclude, let's say, I can maybe um, show this with some example. I mean, a, a realistic example is this here. This is just out of our, our one of our papers. So initially, if you train a ratio estimator, let's say on 20,000 training examples that look like this, you are able to truncate the prior in this range. So you go from the initial prior range to the somewhat smaller prior range. And then you resample from the smaller prior range and get training data that better corresponds to your observation. And the next round, the network is better already in, in measuring some of the parameters, uh, like here uh, the, the length ellipticity, here Einstein radius. And so the truncation becomes tighter and tighter, and at some point it converges. So you need these multiple rounds to do that. If you wanted to do this in one step, it's also in principle possible. What you typically need is a very large number of tr training examples, more like millions or tens of millions, and a very deep network or like a very complex network architecture in order to be able to interpret all the data at once. There are situations where one wants to do that. For instance, if you want to have an if you want to have an inf 
immediate answer to data, in immediate inference result, you could train a model that can interpret all lensing images at once, right? In some sense, then for any new image, you would have instantaneously an answer. But often that's not the problem. Often you have that image, you, it was hard to get it in the first place, and then you just want to analyze that particular image uh, rather than have a pipeline that works very fast. Thanks. So, thanks for the talk. It seems like in your analysis you heavily rely on um, the closeness between your simulated distribution and real-world distribution. Yes. Yeah. So, and I can imagine that in real-world data there are a lot of occlusions that you mentioned, for example, so less lens distortions and so on and so forth. So, how, what, what, which role plays preprocessing, and how do you define a model if it's suitable for your real-world data? Yeah. Yeah, these are very important questions. Um, so first, a failure mode for us, if, if things go wrong, is that often what happens, so let, let's suppose we have a simulation model and the data doesn't look like our simulation model. Then what often happens is that if you do this in multiple rounds, we get in the first round a measurement here, and then the second round a measurement here, and it jumps around. So we would basically yeah, see that the entire pipeline fails, because in the first round we extruded part of the parameters based and in the second round is preferred. So this is kind of instability. Um, then the logic or the goal with all of this here is in some sense to, to enable writing down more realistic models that include more and more effects that are actually relevant for, for real-world data, um, which are often not possible because of the limitations of inference pipelines. And that's, I think, the way to go here. So the, the fact, yeah, the difficulty that often simulation data isn't complex enough to describe real-world data ideally can be addressed by including more and more effects that, that describe real-world data. One of the remaining challenges or things that are brought up in this context is often that if one would have access to the joint distribution, one can do some things like posterior predictive checks. So you can take your random draws from the joint posterior, simulate data for this, and look whether this is similar to the actual model. So kind of goodness of fit tests. That's very, that's less obvious how to do it if one only looks at marginals. So we think about ways of going, doing goodness of fit tests here as well, but these are some of the open questions. Yeah, how, how to detect basically that the model doesn't fit the data fully and how to address this. Any other questions? Doesn't seem to be the case, uh, no question. Oh. We have one there. So you mentioned the, the way you find this this summary uh, embeddings of the dynamic of the dynamical systems are quite uh, problem specific. I mean, I'm yeah. I I guess architectures can change, but ultimately the pipeline that you are using for finding these embeddings is what exactly some sort of uh, projection that you try to embed and then do a reconstruction or. Or how are you actually finding these embeddings to be suitable embeddings? That R right now, it's just like manual trial and error, basically. So, I mean, for, for a specific data set, <laughs> often the nice thing is if you have a specific problems, like suddenly you need to count the number of objects in an image, you can just like look for the corresponding machine learning papers that discuss how to calculate. For instance, for the point source paper, we use an arch architecture that was proposed in a paper where people count the number of cars and parking lot images, stuff like that. So there, there are specialized architectures for all kinds of analysis problems, and of we try to figure out what, you know, from that perspective, what would be the most appropriate. It would be really useful if one could automatize this in some sense, but the nice thing of not having this automatized is that one f is forced to really carefully think about what one actually wants to get out of the data, where the information sits, how it does it sit there, and so on. So it helps a lot in terms of understanding what the pipeline is, is doing, actually. Uh, I have a question related yeah. to the one plot that you've shown uh, previously. Like, um, it was showing like the parameters, like the, um, uh, it was like uh, this correlation parameters between, uh, can you show it to us? I, I, I don't know which one you're uh, talking about. What, was this like a corner plot, or what was this here somewhere? Uh, or earlier on? Mm, oh, this one. 
This one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So um, for some of the parameters, as you can see here, it's like uh, I don't know if I interpret it right, but it's like invariant to the value of the parameter. So you get this infinite support. Yeah. Um, That's true. Yeah. Okay. So um, like during my re my research, I was also like observing this effect, uh, and I'm like curious. It does it bother you like uh, that? the outcome is invariant of the parameter yeah. value? So the, the so the interesting thing is that this has physical reasons. So there are so just some parameters that cannot be measured. And you can see this, I mean, a proof of this in some sense is you get the same problem if you run MCMC. So the blue one is actually, um, the blue one is actually MCMC results. And uh, no, sorry, the blue one is like our results and um, the contours here Sorry, it's up here. Dynasty is the blue, and the contours are our code, and you can see that this agrees reasonably well in the sense that, um, right, so this particular parameter is not picked up by any method. And this typically has to do with something with that the parameter just doesn't affect the data enough to be measurable. This It can also happen that this here appear, occurs um, as a failure mode. So it can be sometimes if you train a net, it doesn't pick up the parameter you care about, and there can be various reasons then the result would look the same. And that's difficult sometimes to interpret if you don't have MCMC to compare to. So then, then it can be tricky. OK, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Um, on the same slide, yeah. uh, how do you recover the correlation between the parameters? Yeah, no, so that, that's a very... Good question. So the, what we do, uh, I didn't show it here completely. What we do is initially we zoom in by just training 1D posteriors. And then in, after the final round, when everything is converged, we train a lot of uh, basically n minus 1 times n divided by 2, I think, uh, networks the for all possible parameter correlations. It's a bit tedious, but it, it, it's still reasonably fast. So there will be then a very large number for each of these um, for each of these insets here, we train this individual MLP. It's, it's reasonably fast because the embedding network is kept the same. So the only thing that we need to do is to train MLPs to, to study these uh, individual parameter correlations. Yeah. And, and the truncation scheme is set up such that that's actually possible. That's kind of the non-trivial thing. Great, thanks. Hey, I think everyone's very um, excited for lunch. First of all, let's uh, thank Christoph with one round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much. It was a fascinating talk. And uh, now on to lunch break. It's one hour, uh, so I'll see you here in one thir at 1.30.